Just like the previous time, Prince Roland Wimbledon met Petrov in the living room. Moreover, although the time was not the regular mealtime, the prince still commanded the attendants to prepare a rich meal. Grilled ham, dried fish slices, an unknown salad prepared with wild herbs, as well as butter, bread, and vegetables that could be seen at any dinner party were prepared. It seemed that the prince liked to talk business during dinner. While Petrov had such thoughts, his hands did not stop for a single moment. After all, in the last few days he hadn't had much of a chance for a meal. Even his own honeysuckle family, when they had no dinner guests, would basically eat only bread with bacon. After dinner, the dessert was served. During this time, Petrov respectfully handed over the letter. Roland took the letter and opened the wax seal with his dining knife. Out of sight, he rolled out the letter and took a quick glance, then he became stunned. The king was dead. Roland had no feelings for this nominal father at all. Since his crossing over, he had been living in border town, so he had never seen his father face to face, let alone that in the fourth prince's memories of his father, his father had only blamed and resented him. Because of this, he felt that he was caught in a very embarrassing situation, should he have a sad look on his face? Reading the following contents, he could smell a conspiracy. Wimbledon III was murdered by his eldest son, under the identity of the new king, the second prince announced the end of the battle for the throne and immediately ordered all of his siblings back to Grey Castle. Roland coughed and raised his head just to see Petrov's apologetic eyes. So, he thought, I'm afraid Duke Ryan will be happy regardless what I do. No matter whether or not I comply to the new king's orders, both are a dilemma of their own. He didn't bring the trading agreement, but instead brought a letter of bad news. I think at the moment he feels very sorry. Roland secretly smiled then folded the letter again, I got it. Well, your highness, then what are you going to? Even if I want to go, I will have to wait until the end of the months of the demons. Right now in the ice and snow, if I'm gone, then what would the people of Border Town do? If it was someone else, Petrov would certainly say something like, do not worry, my Longsong stronghold will help you to handle this situation properly, or any other diplomatic responses. But in front of the fourth prince who he had only seen twice, he couldn't speak carelessly. It was the first time that Petrov loathed his own identity as ambassador. In the end he merely nodded, I understand, should I pass a reply for you? As an answer, Roland called his attendants to bring over a pen and paper. He wrote a quick reply and then sealed it with wax and his own stamp, and handed it over to Petrov. The latter glanced at the envelope. It was clearly written to Prince Timothy Wimbledon of Grey Castle on the cover instead of King Wimbledon IV. Petrov thought, now Roland has made his statement. Chapter 55, A Once in Thousand Years Opportunity. Roland opened the door to his office, seeing that Barav was waiting for him. Roland threw the letter towards his assistant minister, then sat himself on his chair, with his feet on his desk. If he had not been in the presence of an outsider, he would hum a ditty. Your Highness, it's okay to grieve. Barav began to frown while quickly reading the letter. The death of the king is such a tragedy, and he was even murdered by his own son. This is really a tragedy, I don't know what your highness should do next. The trial leading to Gerald's death was just too strange. I want to wait and see what my elder sister and my younger sister decide to do, Roland said, but in any case, there are some things we should do in advance, even if we do it only to be on the safe side. Marav looked at the prince, waiting for him to continue. Because of the replacement of the king, the next few months or even years can become turbulent, so the first thing we should do is safeguard our loved ones and family members. What was more important was the fact that the second prince could kidnap these people to threaten them. Now, if he wanted to maintain Border Town's administration and financial affairs functionality, his assistant minister was indispensable. Roland sipped his tea and then continued, You and Carter, as well as your subordinates should all write them a letter, I will have the guards deliver them while they deliver my response to the king then they will arrange for them to take shelter in other towns. Not in border town. Barav wasn't a fool, after 20 years of political experience he immediately understood the prince's meaning. No, they won't come directly to border town. Roland didn't want the other side to use the families of his subordinates to threaten them, and he also didn't want his subordinates to think that he himself would threaten them with their families, so he chose a compromise. He would first bring them to a more secure town, and after he had a strong foothold in border town, they could be migrated. I understand, I would like to thank your highness for your concern. 
The assistant minister spoke while nodding in agreement, which let Roland feel relieved. It seemed that his subordinates were intelligent people who could think for themselves. Roland declared, another thing we have to talk about is the ore trade. After the last iron ore trade, we will put a stop to the ore trade and sell only rough stones to Willow Town. I need the iron ore saved for our own usage. That wouldn't be good. As a result of that, our revenue would decline, your highness. Yes, but it will not drop too much. Recently the miners found a new deposit of gems, so with this we can make up part of the gap explained Roland, and winter isn't really the time for business, the peddlers hesitate to come trading when they always have to fear an attack of demonic beasts, so we will most likely only have two to three transactions during the next four months. Thus it is obvious to trade rough stones to make up for the less trade, since they are the more cost-effective choice. I see. Varab accepted the explanation and recorded the orders down. After his assistant minister had left, Roland called for Carter and told him, I need to expand the size of the militia, so you will responsible for it and will give out recruitment orders. You will need to quickly evaluate their abilities, and if you find strong members they will be appointed as team captains. You will also implement the same training methods like last time. Your Highness, if I train them according to those training methods, I am afraid the new team will need a very long time before they can be deployed to the battlefield. As long as they are stronger than the mob. Roland dismissed his concerns and told him to do what he said. Despite his input, the training level was far away from that of the army. He was afraid that this level of training was only on the level of a college student military training, but sometimes it was only important to have better combat effectiveness compared to their opponents. In addition to fighting against the brainless demonic beasts, most of the time they would fight against a noble's private army, mercenary soldiers, or if needed, turned into a mixed arm. So as long as they used cross-era weapons and equipment, even an army on the level of college students would be able to cope with it. After Carter left, Roland could not stop himself from laughing. He did not think that such a fortuitous situation would fall into his hands. It was simply like someone sending him charcoal during a snowstorm or handing him a pillow when he was sleepy. Was this bad news for me? Was this a dilemma? Wrong? He didn't know much about Garcia Wimbledon, but he was sure that she wasn't a woman who would allow men to trample on her. The first prince was sentenced to death in such a short time, even if there was no insider, she probably wouldn't easily return to Grey Castle only because the second prince had ordered her. It was the same for himself. He would just stay in border town, so someone would be bound to come out, most likely it would be Duke Ryan from Longsong Stronghold, since he was such a restless person. Otherwise, he wouldn't send someone in this horrible weather during the months of the demons, only to deliver the letter to his hands. One day Duke Ryan would want to confront him, since until Roland left Border Town, Ryan could not rest or eat in peace. Choosing to stay in Border Town would be equivalent to defying the new king's edict. If Roland would only wait until the end of the months of the demons, Duke Ryan would in all likelihood, under the name and banner of Timothy Wimbledon, try to teach him a lesson. That was exactly what Roland wanted. If you asked someone what they needed for faster industrialization, the answer would be undoubtedly, people. Large-scale production required a large number of staff devoted to it, after all, a lot of people were needed to drive huge machines. In that time, the term sheep ate people came into existence. It described, that when tenant farmers in Britain were thrown off their land to starve so that sheep could graze and produce wool for new mills, turning them into free laborers. The industrial age was a cruel time. So long as they unceasingly invested into the education of the laborers they could achieve a generous payment. The more developed the industry, the larger would be the population. If Roland had a problem, then it would be Border Town's low population. Border Town had around 2,000 inhabitants. Even with the newly invented machines, it was only a small type of workshop. There were not many free laborers, so many projects couldn't be expanded. But from where should he snatch so many people? Should he buy slaves? Not to mention, he didn't know from where he could buy so many slaves, adult slaves would cost a lot of money, and they would have little sense of culture. Buying slaves under the age of 10 and teach them would take too long, granted that he would allow child labor, so he would have to wait for many years. Recruit talented people? To this borderland, how many people would be attracted to this town? And for them he would need to spend even more than for slaves. Encourage his people to increase the birth rate? Forced marriages? Forget it. He also couldn't hope to get more people from Longsong Stronghold, 
the kingdom was in a steady state, so if he tried to lay his hands on the surrounding lords, he would become a joke in the future. For the same reason Duke Ryan didn't dare to face Roland openly, he could only take actions in secret. But now it was different, after Timothy took over the throne, he would be eager to have all his competitors disappear, all this could be seen from the recall order. Duke Ryan apparently was able to see this point, once the old king was gone, and he had the control over the west border, so if he didn't try to enforce his rule it would be strange. This was a long-awaited opportunity for Roland. Long Song Stronghold was already for hundreds of years the business center at the west border, with nearly 10,000 residents. But behind the stronghold lay the big cities, without any strong defense. He would just have to beat Duke Ryan, take over the city, and get a large number of freedmen and at the same time he could accumulate a lot of wealth. What would be easier than the annexation of the population? What way would be faster to get wealth than to plunder it? This message was just like a beacon to dispel the mist, illuminating the future path of Roland. He definitely would not miss this golden opportunity. Chapter 56, Between the Mountains Nightingale was slowly moving forward on the mountain path. The path under her feet was only shoulder width. On either side of her was a huge rock wall, separated by 10 feet. But between them was a bottomless ravine and the shoulder-wide path she was walking on, so directly next to Nightingale's feet was a steep cliff and a huge wall out of rock. When she looked into the deep ravine she could only see darkness. While traveling on her shoulder-wide path, Nightingale was always carefully leaning on the rock wall next to her, trying not to avoid losing her footing and falling into the ravine. When she looked up, only a thin shimmer could be seen from the sky, like a silver thread hanging in the night sky. However, she knew that it was just a little afternoon, even during the day, she still needed to hold a torch. The light coming down the cliff was not sufficient enough to illuminate the road ahead. Walking on this path for a long time even gave birth to the illusion that she was walking in the mountains. The only advantage here was that not much would fall down the gorge, despite the cold wind whistling through the mountains and lifting up the fallen snow. Occasionally there were a few natural snowflakes that fell on her head from, and landed on the mountain walls or on the trail, turning into water vapor. Down here, the temperature wasn't the same as it was in the outside world, occasionally she could see the hot air rising up from below the cliff. If it weren't like this, she wouldn't dare to pass the impassable mountains during the months of the demons. She could hide herself in her own world of fog, but there, it would be still the same temperature. If she were to brave her way through the snow, she estimated that she would freeze to death after an hour of walking. Nightingale didn't want to spend an extra minute down here, she could always feel something in the dark, always watching her, making her blood run cold. If she could, Nightingale would stay in the fog the whole way, but it was a pity that her strength wasn't enough to do that. When she used her ability for a long time, she would quickly become exhausted. Nightingale raised the torch and let it illuminate the opposite cliff. In the faint firelight, she could occasionally see dark shadows on the walls. Nightingale knew that those were caves, which were so deep that light couldn't reach the end of each cave. They looked like orbs of darkness. But on the other side, nearly at the same position, was also a deep hole. It reminded her of the North Slope Mine's rumors, which said that the mine used to be a monster's underground lair, with many forks in the road that extended in all directions, dug out by monsters. The northern slope was part of the mountain range, but it was so far and wide with so many caves, who could say that the caves weren't connected to the mine? The idea made her shiver. To the west of the impassable mountain range was the abandoned barbarian wasteland. It was known that the impassable mountain range extended for several hundreds of miles, with countless undiscovered caves. Nightingale was afraid that this wasteland could give birth to countless monsters. She did not dare think of going into the caves and only concentrated on moving forward. Finally, she could see a change in the road further ahead. The shoulder-wide path split into two, one leading slightly upwards and the other one leading downwards, leading deeper into the darkness without end, no one knew where this pit lead to. While standing on the bifurcation point, the feeling of being stared at had become very intense, as if countless eyes were motionlessly looking at every move Nightingale made, making her have a dry mouth and tongue and giving her a creepy feeling. Nightingale grit her teeth as she opened her world of fog and quickly stepped into it. Soon, the creepy feeling began to disappear. While following the path leading upwards, the surrounding air temperature soon began to fall, but above her head the small thread of silver became bigger. A quarter of an hour later, 
a huge cave opened up directly in front of her, with its entrance slightly higher than the path she was following. When she set foot into the cave she could see a faint fire deep within. Finally, she had reached the Witch Cooperation Association's hiding place. When Nightingale left her world of fog, she was immediately detected by the witch in charge of defense, who instantly set up a wall of black smog to block her. However soon the wall disappeared and a surprised voice could be heard from the darkness, you're back. Nightingale thought, yes I'm finally back, but when she noticed that the girl had two bands tied around her arm, Nightingale's good mood turned directly into grief, once again two sisters were. The other's witch's voice stalled for a moment and then she sorrowfully said, ah, uh, ah, uh, yes. Ari and Abby had their day of adulthood five days ago and didn't survive it. She forced herself to smile, it happens often, doesn't it? But let us not speak about them, you have to go back to the camp, Wendy is always talking about you. Ari and Abby, a pair of twins who left their lives in a wealthy family from the fallen dragon mountain only to die within the impassable mountain range. Nightingale sometimes wondered if what they did was alright. If the twins hadn't left their town with the Witch Cooperation Association, they could have at least enjoyed their lives with their family, rather than following everyone, wandering from one place to another, without any fixed home. However, when she thought of Wendy, Nightingale's heart was filled with warmth. If she hadn't given her a helping hand when she desperately needed it, she was afraid that she herself would still be living a life as a puppet, always fearing to be disposed of just like every other tool. Yes, she should tell her the news as soon as possible, and she should tell it to all her sisters. They weren't required to hide like little mice any longer. Someone was willing to accept all of them, and there may be, they could come out unscathed through their annual day of awakening. When she stepped into the camp, Nightingale saw that a familiar figure was squatting near the campfire handling the food. Until now, the other person hadn't seen that she had arrived, so she couldn't help herself and shouted, Wendy, I'm home. The other witch turned away from her meal and looked towards Nightingale, welcoming Nightingale with her usual smile, Veronica, welcome home. Wendy was the embodiment of a good woman and also one of the first witches of the Witch Cooperation Association. Now she had turned 30, but still any wrinkles couldn't be seen on her face. She had red-brown hair which fell straight down, almost reaching her waist, with mature and charming facial features, which gave her the appearance of a big sister. She was always concerned about each and every sister of the Witch Cooperation Association. Whether it be about their daily life or psychological counseling, she would always try to help no matter what happened. If it wasn't for Wendy, there was a big chance that the Witch Cooperation Association wouldn't have gathered so many witches. She was precisely the reason why Nightingale decided to run away from her family when she met her, embarking with her on a journey into the impassable mountain range, trying to find the holy mountain. She was also one of the few people who knew her original name. How many times have I already told you that I'm no longer that cowardly little girl from the past, said Nightingale while smiling and shaking her head, I'm now a powerful witch, Veronica doesn't exist any longer. You will always be you, breaking away from your former nightmares doesn't mean to part with important and happy moments of your past said Wendy softly, of course, I'm glad you like your new name. Nightingale, I've been waiting for you to come back, surely you had to suffer throughout the whole journey. Well, Nightingale stepped forward and hugged her friend, thank you. After a moment Wendy opened her mouth and asked, what happened to the girl, you, were you too late to save her? When hearing her speak of this, Nightingale's spirit immediately began to rise again. She grabbed the Wendy's arm and said excitedly, no, she did not need me to save her. On the contrary, maybe she is able to save us all. Then she began to describe in detail her experience of her time living in Border Town. Border Town is governed by Lord Roland Wimbledon, fourth prince of the Kingdom of Grey Castle. He is willing to shelter all of us, and he also promised, that one day, that all witches in his territory could live the life of a free person, just like everyone else. Chapter 57, Kara the Snake Witch However, Wendy wasn't as excited as Nightingale had thought she would be. Instead, she asked in a skeptical tone, did he really say that? Yes, even before I arrived in Border Town, he had already rescued two witches, Anna and Nana. From the beginning, the prince never thought that the power of the witch came from the devil. He said it was our own strength. Dash Nightingale suddenly stopped, realizing that the other didn't believe anything. Good stop, she thought, this isn't Wendy's fault. They will probably only believe it when they hear it directly from the prince, but maybe even then they will doubt it. 
After all, it would be exactly what every witch's heart was longing for. We witches were oppressed for far too long, even on the way from the east to the border of the impassable mountain range, we could see many living examples where witches were betrayed and abandoned, without any person who would reach out to them with a helping hand. When thinking about all this, her excitement gradually subsided. Perhaps this trip wouldn't go as smoothly as she had thought. Wendy, you know what my magic had evolved into on my day of adulthood. In addition to being able to see the magic flow within a person, I'm also able to identify if a person is lying or not, stated Nightingale seriously, so when I asked him, why he would take such a big risk to save us witches, he replied, in border town we don't care about your background. He just wants all the witches to be able to live as free people. But while doing this, he will become a thorn in the side of the church, Wendy frowned and asked, even if the prince does not understand what it means, you do know it. Right. Nightingale could not help it but she began to chuckle loudly, my initial thoughts were almost the same like yours, so I asked him, do you think you can really achieve this? And guess how he answered me. She paused, and then repeated verbatim, if you do not step out, you will never know the answer. Wendy was surprised when hearing this and had to ask, that wasn't a lie. No lie confirmed Nightingale. It sounds unbelievable. Wendy's voice became slightly relaxed. She and Nightingale were already friends for many years, so she couldn't think of a reason why she would try to deceive her. Yes, Nightingale deeply sighed. If she hadn't personally heard it, since she could verify it with her ability, she probably wouldn't have believed him so quickly. Now in retrospect, just like when they stood on the city wall and talked about it, Roland really seldom lied. During the two months she stayed at his side, beside the moment they stood on the wall he had sometimes tried to deceive her once, but Nightingale was still very satisfied with his answers. After all, she didn't care that he was trying to deceive her a little. Instead if you would just tell an unknown witch all of your secrets, that would be too ridiculous. Tonight, when we all come together, I want to tell this important news to all of our sisters. Nightingale looked pleadingly at Wendy and said, and I want you to help me convince them. When the evening came, the witches who were busy outside the camp returned one after another. When they saw that Nightingale had safely returned, the witches became very happy, coming towards her and asking her how she did. Seeing that their arms were wrapped in a white cloth, Nightingale felt heavy within her heart, at the beginning she still casually answered a few questions, but with time she turned more and more silent. But then she began to tell her long story. She talked about how she had sneaked into Border Town, how she met Roland, Anna, and Nana, the construction of the city wall, the construction of the steam engine, how they had resisted the attack of the demonic beasts, and finally about Anna's adulthood. Nightingale even took out the drawing of the construction plans for the steam engine, to prove to everyone that she wasn't lying. Most of the witches, after they entered the Witch Cooperation Association, would live a cloistered life. For them, it was difficult to imagine the life in the outside world, so they listened attentively. But when Nightingale said that Anna hadn't suffered any pain during her day of adulthood going through it unscathed, the crowd suddenly began to rage. This was a great concern, the day of adulthood bothered witches for all of their lives, and lead to leaving a sheltered and warm life. They even went into the impassable mountain range, losing everything only to look for the legendary holy mountain. If what Nightingale said was true, that there was a territory lord who was willing to accept them, who even knew how they no longer had to suffer from the demon's bite, wouldn't that have been even more perfect than the holy mountain? At this point, a path began to spread through the crowd, and a witch with a head full of green hair and half of her body plastered with snake tattoos walked in front of Nightingale. When she saw her, Nightingale bowed and greeted her respectfully, respected mentor, hello. The witch who came was the founder of the Witch Cooperation Association, Kara the Snake Witch. When speaking with her, all the witches called her their mentor. I heard the story you just told. When Kara spoke her voice hoarse and hollow, do you want to tell everyone that what we are doing is wrong? No, mentor, those are not stories, I mean. Enough, Nightingale was interrupted by Kara who was waving impatiently, I do not know what happened to you, but when you went to this border town, it made you say such words. A prince, that sympathizes with a witch? It's practically as laughable as sympathizing with a frog, she turned around with a cold smile, and raised her arms in the air shouting, sisters? Have you all forgotten how those mortals treated you all? Not even letting Nightingale say something, she continued to shout, Yes, that group of mortals, the group of incompetents who pretend to fight in the name of God, 
who are always aiming a sharp blade or whip at us. If there wasn't a god's locket of retribution, how could they step on us witches? Our ability doesn't come from the devil, instead it is a gift given by God. The one who take charge of God's authority shouldn't be them, but we, us the sisters of the Witch Cooperation Association. The holy mountain recorded in ancient books, is the residence of the gods. What? Nightingale couldn't believe what she had heard, though the leader of the Witch Cooperation Association was always considered as an eccentric. She was strongly attached to the search for the holy mountain, with a passion exceeding that of any ordinary person, but she was always very far from madness. Although Kara wasn't as approachable as Wendy, at least she had always treated the concern of her sisters with sincerity. But Nightingale had never thought that she could be so hostile to ordinary people. Could it be that over the past few years she had always been suppressing her hatred and anger? The so-called not to get involved into profane affairs, merely in order to save power, only so that we can one day impose a thunder-like retaliation in the future? Nightingale thought to herself, was that the true reason why Kara hid herself? We have found a clue to the gate of the holy mountain, it is just like it is described in the ancient books. It's only 20 more days until the red moon will appear in the night sky just like a drop of blood, raising from the direction of the great Shimin, we will eventually arrive on the other side, suddenly Kara stopped to speak and turned back to look at Nightingale and exclaimed, you've been fooled by mortals, since we have been born we had lived in a huge scam. The suffering during the day of adulthood is a test by God, only the strong willed, with indomitable talent and genuine power can pass it. As for the church, she sneered for the second time, they are a group of mortals who dare to borrow and act in the name of God, sooner or later they will have to go to hell. And you, child, now it's time to come back, Kara paused for a moment and then continued, if you forget those stories you just told, I can forgive your ignorance and mistakes. As a member of the Witch Cooperation Association, you will get help from us, and together with us, you will go on the search for the holy mountain, to obtain eternal freedom. Nightingale's heart had turned completely cold. The pain was only a test. That suffering during the day of awakening, the sisters who weren't strong enough to hold on, they weren't worth it, they were only losers. This argument was simply exactly the same as that of the church. While the surrounding witches unexpectedly exposed an expression of resonance, even Wendy didn't come out to express her disapproval. Nightingale suddenly felt dull, and within the blink of an eye, the founder of the Witch Cooperation Association, every witch's mentor, had turned into a stranger. Nightingale shook her head, so, I'll be willing to take every sister with me who want to leave, but if you decide to stay, I wish you good luck. Just as Nightingale was ready to leave, suddenly a slight tingle could be felt in her lower leg. When she looked down, she could see that a fine, shining blue and black striped snake had bitten her into her calf, this was Kara's magic of the snake, it was silent and she could use a variety of toxins. The paralysis quickly spread through her whole body, so when Nightingale tried to open her mouth to say something, she fell into darkness. Chapter 58, Escape Nightingale didn't know how long it lasted, but when she woke up she discovered that her hands were tied to a stake. The same could be said about her waist and feet, they were also tied to the stake. She tried to free herself by struggling, but her body was tied to the pole so strongly, that she was totally immobile. The next step was to try using her magic ability, but she couldn't feel the familiar feeling when reaching for her power, she seemed to be also cut off from her magic powers, so she was completely tied up. When Nightingale looked down along her body, she saw that a transparent prismatic stone was hanging down from her neck. You're finally awake. Kara walked in front of her and begun to talk to Nightingale, what do you think about my petrifying venom? Honestly, I had high hopes for you, Nightingale. However, sadly you couldn't live up to my expectations. Nightingale didn't know how to answer first but then she took a deep breath and spoke reproachfully, you were actually hiding a god's locket of retribution. Kara, do you still know what you are doing? This stone was originally shackles used by the church to suppress witches, but now even their own mentor used it to deal with her, just like the church. Though what made her even more angry was the callous look on the faces of the surrounding crowd, it seemed that there was nothing wrong with what they were seeing. Damn it, cried Nightingale at the bottom of her heart, don't you think that you turned into the kind of person who us witches hate the most? This is only a tool, which will be occasionally used to punish bad girls who won't listen. Explained Kara indifferently, and you, Nightingale, are such a person who need to be punished, or, should I call you Veronica? 
born within a noble family, got reduced to a witch, but still thinking about how to climb the social hierarchy. I don't know what you're talking about. You let me down. When Wendy saved you from the clutches of the aristocracy, I thought you would stand firmly on the side of us, the Witch Cooperation Association. But, look at what you're doing right now, when we will soon discover the Holy Mountain, you want to stop us from achieving our goal. Kara shook her head and laughed loudly, but then continued, trying to take us sisters with you to the prince? Were you kept captive for too long and now servility has deeply rooted itself into your being, so that you can only live on when you find for yourself a master, or else, do you just want to sell them to the nobles, in exchange for receiving a good position for yourself? Everything I do is for my sisters. Nightingale had to swallow down her anger, after all shouting would be meaningless, so she said calmly I hope that no one will have to die during their day of awakening, hoping that they can live without worrying where they get clothes and food for their daily life. I never intended to stop your plan, but us sisters should have the right to freely choose our own way of life. At the moment Border Town is undergoing tremendous changes, I brought even the construction plan for the steam engine. It can operate on its own, with a nearly infinite force. With this kind of machine, the water within the mines can be directly pumped out, so that people don't need to do it every day any longer. Kara sneered once more and asked pejoratively, are you talking about this? She turned around and pulled a roll out of the stack of parchments and rolled it out, so that everyone could see it. Although I don't understand everything painted on this parchment, but who would believe that a bunch of dead, cold iron can be pieced together so that it can work independently like a living creature? Do you think we are all three years old children? She walked to the front of the brazier and threw the roll into the charcoal. No, cried Nightingale in vain, only able to stare blankly while the blueprint turned into ashes within the brazier. My patience has been exhausted, I will only give you one last chance while she threatened Nightingale. Kara took an iron skewer out of the brazier, whose end had already turned bright red from the heat. If you plead guilty in front of all your sisters of the Witch Cooperation Association, admitting that you have been bewitched by the aristocracy, I can spare your life, but the whipping is unavoidable? After all this will be your lesson for cooperating with the enemy. But if you will still be stubborn, I will have to use this iron skewer to pierce your heart, nailing your body at the stake, so that everyone can learn from your wrongdoings. After waiting for a second she said, do not miss my last offer of mercy, tell me now how have you decided. Holding the iron closer to Nightingale, so that she could have a better look, holding it so close that she could even feel the scorching heat coming from its tip. If she was still her cowardly self from before, she would have bowed and admitted defeat. But she had already bid farewell to her past self, no longer being that timid girl. Now she was Nightingale, a powerful witch, even in front of death she wouldn't yield, so she only closed her eyes, awaiting the arrival of her last moment. She didn't know why, but an image of Roland appeared in front of her eyes. Stop! shouted someone suddenly, for a moment Nightingale hesitated, but then she opened her eyes. Nightingale could see that Wendy walked out of the crowd and said to Kara, Mentor, look at the white cloth wrapped around your arm. We already have experienced so many deaths, do you really want to add another one? What? even you are being deceived by her. Wake up, Wendy. What she said are all lies. I do not know. Wendy shook her head and continued, I do not intend to go with her to border town, but I think that one of the things she said was right. We sisters should have the right to freely choose our own way of life. She turned around and loudly asked the crowd, which of you want to leave with her? No one within the crowd answered her, the scene fell into silence. So there is no problem when she is leaving alone said Wendy. She didn't harm the Witch Cooperation Association, so I really cannot watch you kill her. Nightingale had fully understood the meaning of Wendy's words. She couldn't help but get a sad feeling within her heart. Even Wendy didn't completely believe what she had said. So because of this she kept silent when she needed her help when trying to convince everyone. But she was still the good-hearted and caring witch, even if she didn't agree with her point of view, she would still lend a helping hand. After Wendy's remark, some whispering voices could be heard from within the crowd, and then a few people spoke up for her. Yes, since she is willing to return to the secular world, just let her go. The church and the pain have already taken so many sisters away from us. Respected mentor, please think about her punishment once more. Everyone shut up. Kara raged and shouted, if I let her leave, what will we do when a second or a third nightingale appear? Also if she sells the position of our camp to the church, 
then we will have nowhere to escape, the voices didn't quiet down, so she lifted her arm to hit Nightingale with the iron skewer. But Wendy was a step faster, producing a strong breeze of wind, throwing Kara onto the ground and stopping her striking attempt. Then she threw a coin into the air, raised and waved her hand, leading the rapid airflow to wrap around the coin and shooting it in the direction of Nightingale. When the airstream came near Nightingale it instantly disappeared. Yet the coin still maintained its speed, accurately hitting the god's locket of retribution around Nightingale's neck. The transparent and prismatic stone released a hitting sound and instantly broke. Traitor. Kara screamed furiously while standing up from the ground, Wendy and Anne belonged to her inner circle and were her right hands, but now one of them had betrayed her. Out of anger she threw out a shadow snake which flew with its mouth open in the direction of Wendy, biting her ferociously at the back of her hand. At this moment the ropes fell to the ground, still maintaining their wrap-up formation around the stake, only Nightingale wasn't any longer at her place, bonded to the stake. When thinking about Nightingale's ability, Kara felt cold sweat running down her back. She instantly mobilized all of her magic, creating magical snakes, gleaming with all possible color variations, which then poured out of her chest. Ordering them to form a wall, she herself rushed backwards, but Nightingale was still faster than her. Only one step, just after one step, she already appeared behind Kara, thrusting her hands forward, the iron hammer, which actually should have pierced her own heart, went straight through Kara's body. Chapter 59, Explorer. Respected Mentor. When they saw that Kara had fallen, all the witches around her began to panic. Idiots? Ahem, Kara tried to cover the wound with her hand, she could no longer feel her lower body, quickly, go and kill the traitors for me. However, at that time Nightingale, who was carrying Wendy, had already turned into fading mist. When they arrived back at the fork in the road, Nightingale realized that Wendy had fallen unconscious and her arm had turned black, the venom was spreading within her. Now, no hesitation was allowed and every second counted. She gnashed her teeth, ripped off the sleeve around Wendy's injured arm and then used it to bind the arm as tightly as she could. Then, she drew a dagger from the sole of her boot, and opened Wendy's wound. After less than half a quarter of an hour later, she had cut open Wendy's arm. As long as the arm wasn't cut off, Nana would be able to heal her. When she had done everything she could do, Nightingale took out two straps and bound Wendy on her back. As long as Nightingale was able to bring Wendy to border town alive, Nana would be able to completely heal her. But to keep her alive for so long, was it possible? She alone already took three days on the way here, but now while carrying a person she would naturally need longer. If she were to go faster and accidentally slide down the trail, she wasn't sure if she could climb up again. Wendy's arm was still losing blood, she would never last three or four days, but Nightingale had no other choice. She would never be able to leave Wendy, after all, she was only injured because of her. Do you need help? Suddenly, a voice could be heard out of nowhere. Nightingale was frightened and almost simultaneously opened her own world of fog, and assumed a defensive position. However, there was no person in front of her. You don't need to be nervous, I didn't come to fight. When Nightingale looked up, she could actually see a person flying in the air. Then, she asked, confused, who are you? My name is Lightning, I just joined the Witch Cooperation Association recently. Since I'm always away, it is normal that you don't know me. She tried to smile easily, however, I know you, the famous Nightingale, the Shadow Assassin. Did Kara send you? No, no, don't misunderstand me. Lightning slowly came downwards, setting her feet on the earth in the end, I want to go with you. Nightingale couldn't believe what she heard so she asked, what? You said, ah, we should have the right to freely choose our own way of life, Lightning paused for a second and then said, I choose to go with you, it's that simple. What is? Nightingale was already completely disappointed by the reaction of her sisters, even Wendy hadn't fully believed in her, but now this girl in front of her, she was actually still a child around 14 or 15 years old, like Nana. She had fresh and neat short blonde hair, a face full of high spirits and speech and self-confidence that didn't match her age. Also, she didn't wear the usual Witch Cooperation Association uniform. Instead, she wore a set of long trousers tailored to match her personal preferences, with many pockets and patches. This could also be said about her vintage leather jacket. The last part of her attire was a crude-looking belt that was fastened around her waist, only God knew where she had picked it up. 
At first glance, this just looked like a man's clothing. You said that there's a machine that huffs and puffs out black and white smoke, and that you can also create stones out of grey powder and even have powder that breaks apart mountains with a thunderous bang. I want to see everything. Lightning was talking full of enthusiasm, I'm determined to become an explorer who, of course, only goes to interesting places. What kind of a reason was this? Nightingale was startled, and she couldn't make a sound, but even in this kind of conscious she could still tell that Lightning was not lying. I do not understand. If you want to be an adventurer, why would you leave the Witch Cooperation Association and join me? Not an adventurer, I want to be an explorer. Lightning stressed, I'm not one of those who are only driven by money, who say that they are risk takers, but in fact are only doing the dirty work of others. Explorers only act out of interest? Are you asking why L don't want to be with the Witch Cooperation Association? Explained Lightning confidently, who are looking for the holy mountain, which should be the dream of every explorer. Kara doesn't understand the spirit of adventure, she is completely immersed in the old book, only looking along the road for the characteristics described in the ancient book. She is walking through the mountain range only searching for two weathered pillars rising out of the ground. If this is the way she does it, she will never find the real holy mountain. My father always stressed the point that an explorer must honestly record everything they see when looking for a fine horse by using only a picture, that's just the way an explorer should handle the matter. Although Nightingale would have loved to know what kind of father would teach such ideas and raise such an absolutely strange daughter, now wasn't the right moment to chat. After all, Wendy's life was at risk. Since she didn't mean any harm, an additional helper would be appreciated. In the end Nightingale only asked, your ability is flying. Well yet, yeah, Lightning nodded and said proudly, I can even carry you both, and flow forever forward, just like the wind. Then I will have to trouble you. Nightingale made sure that Wendy was strongly bound to her back and then she held on Lightning's shoulders, and wrapped her hands around Lightning's chest. Ah, uh, really heavy. Lightning grit her teeth, and slowly rose upwards, I think we probably won't be as fast as the wind. Thus, they began their strange form travel. When Lightning was exhausted, she would be carried by Nightingale, who took everyone through her world of fog. When Lightning was physically recovered, Nightingale would then climb onto Lightning's back, so that she could fly forward again. When both of them were exhausted and compelled to rest, Nightingale would find the time to ask her some basic questions, for example, who her father was, or the situation with her family. Lightning said that her father was the world's greatest explorer and that he even traveled across the ocean. He had an ocean sailing fleet and was affectionately called Thunder by his crew. However, she had lost her mother when she was still very young, so she didn't have many memories of her. While on a sea voyage, her ship had run aground and capsized during a storm. Lightning was lucky and was rushed to an island by the ocean currents, but she lost all contact with her father. On the island, Lightning used the knowledge and skills her father taught her to survive, nearly spending two months alone on that island before she awoke during the winter. With her new ability she flew westwards across the channel to the south of Grey Castle. After going through numerous setbacks, she joined the Witch Cooperation Association in the end. She felt that as long as she adhered to exploring, one day she would be able to come across a miracle and see her father again, as long as he was still alive. Nightingale didn't gain much useful information from this dialogue. Her ability could only be used to distinguish if the other side was lying, but she couldn't determine the authenticity of the spoken content. In other words, as long as the other person said that the sun was square and didn't doubt it, her ability would still show that they were telling the truth. However, there was actually some information that could be inferred. For example, she must have been born in a wealthy family, families who were struggling with poverty wouldn't have the time to explore. The fact that her father had an ocean-going fleet was also consistent with this judgment. Therefore, Thunder's true identity was perhaps a wealthy ocean-crossing businessman. Lightning had blonde hair, unlike the descendants of the kingdoms of the mainland and more like the sea people from across the fjords. Wendy had awoken several times. During these times, Nightingale would always try to let her drink as much water as possible, but after drinking, she lost her consciousness again. Nightingale could feel that Wendy's body temperature was falling lower and lower. This made Nightingale feel increasingly anxious. The two had no other alternative than hurrying, and the normally three-day-long path took them one and a half days to finish. At the entrance, the horses the prince had left for them were still tied to the ground, 
and the heap of straw in front of them was still only half eaten. Nightingale climbed on one horse while carrying Wendy and let it run, followed by Lightning as she rushed non-stop towards Border Town. Chapter 60, Arrangements Border Town's second militia recruitment went much smoother than the first one. After all, during the winter, the food was rationed so the members of the militia would be given more and better food. On the weekly visiting day, there would be many soldiers who would secretly transfer bread and meat, which they had saved during the week, to their loved ones. Roland told Carter and Iron Axe to overlook these matters, because when those loved ones happily stayed at home with food, they would surely tell their neighbors where they got it. This would be a perfect example of word-of-mouth recommendation, executed by his militia. The conversations between neighbors were much more effective than information announced by the city hall. At this point, most of the urban areas of the town already knew about it. His Highness Militia wasn't only well paid, but would also eat three meals every day. In addition, the fight with the demonic beast didn't seem so dangerous as previously thought. So during the second recruitment, there were many more candidates than during the first one, and even residents of the better districts came for registration. The number of people who matched the requirements were much higher than the Roland had expected, so the second recruitment accepted 200 new members who would be trained by Carter during the weekdays. When the horn sounded, the new recruits would also rush to the wall to stand as auxiliary forces on standby. The chief knight and the assistant minister raised some objections, like that at this point the new batch of militia wasn't qualified to fight against the demonic beasts, or that the newly recruited unit had more than twice the number of soldiers of the first unit, which wasn't necessary. Increases of the general public food rations and salary would lead to the increase of their financial expenditure, but even so, if they gave out more gold royals they would not achieve a significant effect. However, Roland kept to his decision even though these people were not prepared to deal with the demonic beasts. Yet he didn't dare to inform his men about the plan he came up with. No one was allowed to know that he intended to attack the Duke's stronghold, if he told them about his idea now, he was afraid that Baravan Carter would find it totally unacceptable. The difference between the Longsong stronghold and Border Town was just too big. As the official border stronghold of the Kingdom of Grey Castle, its walls were 10 feet tall, and was built brick by brick by stonemasons. With the Duke's private army and the six noble families' private armies and also the city's own soldiers, they could mobilize more than 1,000 soldiers. In theory, it was impossible to win a siege when one could only rely on his own army of 300, even if they were equipped with crosshair guns. And because of the God's Stone of Retribution, the witches couldn't be used as an assassination squad, Roland had confirmed this point several times with Nightingale. Duke Ryan and the important people of the six families would purchase these stones, not leaving anything to spare, of course, for the outside world this purchase was called donation. If someone wanted to buy such a stone, they had to donate several dozens of gold royals. Banning the power of the witches within a certain range was the most powerful weapon against the so-called devil's servants and was the biggest annual income source for the church. Roland only had a chance when it was an open field fight. Thanks to this era, most of the soldiers were drafted before a battle. So if the Lord didn't want his drafted army to flee halfway, he was required to travel with his army, which would present a perfect opportunity to implement Roland's annihilation plan. However, he was still unsure about how he could take advantage of this opportunity. After all, his experience of war tactics came only from movies and television works, or historical stories, so he had no experience of his own. In the end, he thought that since he didn't understand it, he should first do the things he was good at. Roland wanted to stretch out a little and left his office to take a walk in his backyard. The steam engine too was assembled and standing quietly in the middle of the field. At first glance, the new steam engine looked much cleaner than the previous one, and the welding marks were no longer as uneven as before. This masterpiece was possible thanks to Anna's new capabilities. Her green fire could drill into the tiniest gaps for welding, allowing for the individual parts to fit better together than in the past. However, the most important difference between the steam engine 2 and the older steam engine wasn't the overall look, but the integration of a centrifugal governor. The first set of the automatic control system and feedback system in human history could be considered as a big milestone. Roland's governor's structure was very simple, consisting of two iron balls connected with a string to a main rod. At first glance it was just like the bamboo dragonflies that children played with during their childhood. If someone quickly rubbed the bamboo pole, 
the two rotating blades would be forced to automatically rise due to the centrifugal force. For the governor, the equivalent for the fan was the two iron balls, when the steam engine worked, the main rod would be driven to rotate, and when the output increased too high, the balls would spin faster, gradually increasing their height under the influence of the centrifugal force, closing the valve bit by bit. When the output decreased, the ball speed would also get slower, lowering their position under the influence of gravity, thereby increasing the valve output again. This always kept the steam engine running at a relatively fixed power level. With speed control, it was now possible to let the steam engine to take over some of the more sophisticated processing tasks. The gears produced by the blacksmiths were delivered and neatly placed in a corner of the shed. Looking at them with the perspective of an industrial production line, none of these gears could be called qualified to work with and all of them would be thrown into the defective box, waiting to be recycled. But in terms of this age, they were rare works of art, the design of involute gears were created with a sense of harmony. The gears that had been immersed in lard emitted a unique metallic sheen. In addition to produced gears, carpenters who were responsible for the planning had already built the foundation as well as other parts that were already prepared. He let the door guards call for Anna so that they could begin to assemble the first steam-powered borer together. They began Roland's plan, which he thought was the most effective plan to mass-produce rifles. Relying only on blacksmiths who had to manually knock out a barrel was extremely time-consuming, but also very boring for the blacksmiths themselves. Now, he only had to take out an iron bar and he could directly drill the barrel out with the borer. So in one day, he would be able to produce more than 10 barrels. At the same time, by replacing the head, the boring machine couldn't only be used to cut but also to engrave the rifling. With rifled flint locks, the firing accuracy would be further improved. Thus, he was confident that before the end of winter, the two groups of militia, nearly 300 people, could all be armed with rifles. However, Roland couldn't guarantee that his army would be able to calmly load, aim, and shoot at their targets in the face of charging knights. It was more realistic to think that they would rather drop their weapons, turn tail, and run away. After all, the training time of the two troops were too short, they had no combat experience against other humans. So, he had to bring out a more powerful weapon onto the battlefield, a weapon which could defeat the enemy even before they could start their own assault. That was artillery. As the god of war in the history of human warfare, the destruction and deterrence brought by artillery wasn't reproducible by guns. A six-pound field artillery had the range to attack the other side before they were even able to gather. The mixed-up armies of this era would surely be unable to maintain discipline in combat while being under constant fire. As long as he could get three or four field guns, his enemy would never have the chance to charge. Roland was following a step-by-step -step plan, with his manual milling machines, which could be used to process usable steering gear, he would be able to produce the speed controllable steam engine too, and with this machine he could create his own borer. With steam boring, he would be able to process a variety of gun barrels and cannon barrels. There was still at least two months until the end of the months of the demons, so as long as his plans played out smoothly, Border Town's militia would have the power to compete with the Duke in a full-out battle. Chapter 61, Return just when Roland squatted down to install the base for the new steam engine, three figures suddenly emerged out of thin air. They landed, staggering, in front of his feet and took him with them when they fell to the ground. Anna was so scared that she immediately jumped back and set up a wall of green flames to try to block the strangers. When Roland looked up, he found that one of the women was the long-awaited nightingale. From her face, she seemed very exhausted. Her cheeks were abnormally red, so obviously she had been running in the cold and windy weather for a long time, but despite the wind, her forehead was covered with dense sweat. Nightingale lifted her head and cried with palpable anxiety. Your Highness, please call Nana and have her come over. We need her immediately. Now, Roland noted that the woman tied to her back was very pale and had her eyes closed. She was wrapped in clothes which were dark red from the oozing blood and had a nearly cut off arm. He immediately reacted and shouted toward his guard. Carden, run to the medical center and fetch Nana. Yes, your highness, answered the guard as he dashed away immediately. Aside from these two, there was also a young girl caught in Nightingale's armpit. She looked like she wasn't in a serious situation, and was looking around with eyes full of curiosity. You aren't hurt, right? Roland stepped forward to untie the woman with the injured arm from Nightingale's back. I'm fine, your highness, Keek. I'm very sorry, 
I couldn't bring back my sisters from the Witch Cooperation Association. Nightingale gasped for air, her voice was very weak. Apparently she had had a very long journey and had almost physically overextended herself. Say nothing more, you need to rest first. Roland picked up the unconscious and injured woman and let Anna lead Nightingale. Like this, the five people returned to the castle. Nightingale had the room next to Anna's, so when they came to the castle, he immediately ordered the maids to build a fire in her room and to also deliver a vat of hot water. After Nana arrived, he first explained to her what had happened before she began to clean the wound and treat the injury while Roland stepped out of the room. As long as she wasn't dead, Nana would be able to heal every injury like they had never happened, so the problem wasn't if she could save her life. Although Nightingale had carefully tied up the arm, the blood circulation had been cut off for far too long, so he did not know if it could be saved. The following cleaning and treatment required the patient to undress, so as a gentleman, Roland consciously chose to step out. But how could it have developed into this? Asked Roland himself. Could it be that the witch camp was attacked by demonic beasts and there was no one else she was able to save? If that was true, then that would really be a great loss. Roland was nervously hovering at the door. About half an hour later, the door was pushed open and the first person who came out was the unknown girl who looked unharmed and who had come together with Nightingale. When she saw him waiting in front of the door, she nodded and said, you're exactly the same as Nightingale had described you. Roland didn't know what to make out of this sentence, what did she say about me? A prince who would care about us witches while answering his question, the girl lightly shut the door, unfortunately, the news was so unbelievable that most of the witches didn't believe what she said. In fact, I also couldn't believe her, but it is exactly like my dad had always said, the world is so big, and it has all kinds of people. My name is Lightning, your highness, glad to meet you. When she finished speaking, she bowed her head and laid her right hand on her left shoulder, it probably was her way to salute. However, Roland didn't think any longer about the salute, the part most people did not believe her, was the important information. The Witch Cooperation Association wasn't attacked by demonic beasts. Attack? No, ah, uh, why would you think this? She nodded her head while thinking but then she suddenly put her index finger on her forehead and revealed an enlightened expression, yes, I see. That big sister with the broken arm is Wendy, she was injured by our respected mentor Kara. Then, Lightning began to tell the story. After hearing what had happened, Roland fell silent and thought, so it was actually like this. I really have underestimated the cruel oppression the witches have to face. Now, after being accumulated over many years, the hatred between the witches and the upper nobility of the church has reached its peak. This Kara, is one of the extremists. Then, Roland got the impression that the first thing the leader of the Witch Cooperation Association would do when she had the power to do it was to eradicate people with the same attitude like herself. But fortunately, Nightingale was still able to return safely. And not only that, but she even brought back two new witches with her to border town. As for the witch house, Roland thought, he would still let Carl build it. Even if they didn't need it at the moment, there was still the possibility that the number of witches would increase. So you were also a sister of the Witch Cooperation Association. Not anymore. Lightning sighed and then continued, it's the same for Wendy and Nightingale. Since we left, it is now impossible to ever go back. I'm afraid Kara won't be able to swallow her pride. Will she survive even though Nightingale pierced through her body? Roland asked disbelievingly. Probably. In the camp we have a witch called the Herb Witch, who can increase the effectiveness of herbs several times, explained Lightning by multiplying the effect of some hemostatic grasses and turning them into a blood replenishing medicine, rescuing Kara's life should not be a problem, but compared to your witch who has the ability to heal, the effect is inferior. Hearing this, Roland thought, this will really be a nuisance, it seems like it wasn't enough to just worry about to the church, now I also have to look out for the witches. Fortunately, their purpose is to look for the holy mountain, so I hope the trouble of looking for Nightingale is too much for them. Previously you had said that you didn't believe in what Nightingale had said, so why did you go with her and leave the Witch Cooperation Association? Because you have a machine that huffs and puffs black and white smoke, and you can also create stones out of grey powder and even have powder that breaks apart mountains with a thunderous bang. Lightning repeated the exact same words she had said to Nightingale, maybe there wasn't be a prince who was good to the witches, but she wouldn't have lied to me, 
it is impossible to make up such lifelike ideas, at least this was what my intuition of an explorer had told me, and just seeing the monstrosity in the yard which is capable of ejecting white gas shows me that I was right. This monstrosity? Nightingale seems to call it, a steam engine, right? Explorer. Roland automatically ignored the last question. Yes, Explorer. Lightning emphasized the word, this is the reason why I choose to follow Nightingale. All explorers are curious about the unknown. Roland secretly sighed. What should I do with this witch? Someone like her could only survive in this age if they were born in a rich family. Anyone only had to look at her once to see that she was a tomboy, not only because of her clothes, but also her short golden hair, are you sure your name isn't Isawariel? Isawariel is the Chinese name for Ezreal from League of Legends. Who would that be? My name is Lightning the little girl proudly explained. At this point, the door opened once more and Anna and Nana came out. How was it? asked Roland, did the healing go well? Seeing Nana nod, Roland could finally feel relieved. Generally, a limb needed to be reconnected within 6 to 8 hours. When this time limit was exceeded, the success rate would be greatly reduced. Since Lightning said that they had taken more than one day to travel from the camp to border town, the chance to save the limb was actually already very small. It would almost be impossible to reconnect the nerves by conventional surgery. This once more showed how unbelievable Nana's healing ability was. Now the young witch was also tired, it seemed that the treatment also cost her great effort. So Roland encouragingly said to them, you all have worked hard today, so after eating dinner, you both should sleep here with Anna. Of course, he thought that would also mean that Serpine would also sleep here. Chapter 62, Oath. Today was such an exciting day with so many surprising matters that Roland didn't want to continue the boring work with the steam engine. Instead, he had his chef prepare an exceptionally great dinner of black pepper steak and fried eggs without any limit to the amount everyone could eat. After eating, Lightning and Anna had to pat their bloated bellies while Nana, chewing on the last piece of meat, was still full of vitality. In addition to the dinner, he had asked the maid to prepare and deliver a stew out of soft meat and waxy porridge in a heat-preserving porcelain dish to Nightingale. Once Nightingale and Wendy woke up, they could immediately eat hot food. After dinner, the next step was to arrange rooms for everyone. Fortunately, the lords of Border Town loved exquisiteness and grandeur. Even though this small town was only built for mining, as an early security point, the castle was still built to the standards of a medium-sized town. Thanks to this, Roland now had a 900 square meter living area spread over three floors, along with watchtowers and arrow towers in the form of pagodas in the four corners of the castle. He also possessed his own vestibule and back garden. Roland arranged the room opposite of Anna's room for lightning while the room next door went to Wendy after her rehabilitation. When Roland saw Nana walk into Anna's room with a sugar stick in her hand, he could not help but shake his head in amusement. Back at his office, Roland poured himself a cup of ale. A plan was only good until the first deviation. He had thought that with the help of Nightingale, he would have gotten a batch of new witches, getting a boost in science and technology and upgrading agriculture etc., but he had never expected that the leader of the Witch Cooperation Association would have such hostility towards non-witches. Witches like Nightingale seemed to be a minority. Wendy, after the talk with Lightning he knew that Wendy actually didn't want to leave the Witch Cooperation Association. She only intended to save Nightingale, but after her intervention, she was treated as a traitor by Kara and the other witches. After his first drink, Roland poured himself a second one. Even if the ale wasn't the best, it was still better than nothing. During the meal, Roland had asked Lightning about her and Wendy's abilities. Lightning said she could fly like a bird and fly freely through the air while Wendy was able to control the wind. Hearing this, Roland couldn't think of a good use for a technological upgrade, but for the upcoming war they held great potential. He also asked her about the abilities of the other witches at the camp and found out that their abilities varied strongly and seemed not to follow any rules. Some effects could hardly be described with science while some were completely bizarre. For example, Kara the Snake Witch, the founder of the Witch Cooperation Association. She could condense her magic into snakes, these snakes were not illusions, they could be touched and also attack an enemy. The different colors of the snakes represented the different venoms. Lighting herself had only seen two types of snakes, paralysis and toxic. Roland found that it wasn't only Anna, but Kara and the other witches could also only use their magic within a small range. For example, 
When Anna's green fire left a range of 5 meters, it would suddenly disappear. Kara's snakes also couldn't stray too far. For Nightingale, it was an even shorter distance. When she wanted to influence a foreign object, she would have to leave her fog and become visible. For this reason, they were always equipped with crossbows in case they had to face the church or any other army who possessed God's Stone of Retribution. Otherwise, they could only flee in all directions. Roland worked until midnight, and the fire in the fireplace had already dimmed. When he began to sneeze he thought it was time to sleep. When he opened the door to his bedroom, he thought that he had gone into the wrong room. It was the already familiar scene again, where a woman was already in the room, sitting on his bed. Her figure was half shrouded in darkness, her shadow reflected by the fire was only displayed in mosaic, like a mural. However, this time there was a big difference to the previous instances, namely that the woman was no longer wearing her body hiding robes. Instead, she had replaced them with ordinary civilian clothes. Her appearance was no longer hidden from the outside world, and now everyone could directly see her appearance. Nightingale. Roland became a little nervous, this kind of battle, would it be a lucky one? When Nightingale noticed that the prince had come in, she got up and slowly walked over. Even only after half a day of rest, her face looked better than how most people would ever look. Her pale cheeks were replaced with rosy ones, and her hair didn't give her a dull appearance. He thought, I have to say, the resilience of a witch is really amazing. You worked hard in the past few days. Roland coughed, breaking the silence and then continued, why don't you rest longer? Lightning has already told me everything. Hearing this, Nightingale shook her head, giving a solemn impression. This gave Roland the feeling that something was wrong, and in her eyes he could see an indescribable dedication. Roland realized that she had made her decision and was converging her emotions towards him. This look of determination was difficult to see in many other people, so Roland waited until the other had found the right words. However, Nightingale didn't begin to speak immediately. Instead, she took a deep breath, got down on one knee while holding a dagger in her hand, and slightly bowed her head, this was the etiquette for the standard night ceremony, when someone part of the aristocracy swore allegiance to a superior, they would often do it this way. Your Highness Roland Wimbledon, I, Veronica, also known as Nightingale, swear, she said in a formal tone, as long as you will be kind to the witches, I will be at your service, whether as a strong shield against the demons, or as your personal sword during the night, without any fear of regret, until the last moment of my life. Roland thought, so this is her decision after the Witch Cooperation Association became such a disappointment to her and destroyed her hope of leading the witches into a better future herself. If it went like he wanted, he would refuse her offer, since he was more accustomed to hiring or working together. If there were further ambitions and a common ideal, they could become comrades. However, he knew that sometimes it was meaningless to emphasize equality and freedom. As long as there was no suitable soil, even the best seeds would decay. As a prince, he wouldn't be able to depart from his role as a prince until he unified the kingdom. After a moment of silence, Roland acted accordingly to the court etiquette in the memories of the former prince. He took her dagger and then touched her shoulders three times with his own sword, I accept your allegiance. Nightingale's shoulders trembled slightly. It seemed she could finally relax. Then he stretched out his right hand, holding it in front of her. Nightingale took his fingers and delicately kissed him on the back of his hand. With this the ritual came to an end. Although the allegiance ceremony exercised by the witches was extremely nondescript, following through the whole set of actions couldn't be archived with an ordinary background. And she also called herself Veronica. Is Veronica your real name? Don't you have a last name? Roland pulled her up and asked. Yes, your highness. I have no intention to hide anything from you. Five years ago, I had left the house of Jilin. Now the house and I have nothing to do with each other. Nightingale told him everything, and put down even the last barrier to her heart by telling him of her own past. She was born in Silver City, the city whose name came naturally from their rewarding silver mines. Her father was a viscount, but her mother was born as a commoner. Such marriages were not common, but the two had hit it off well. In addition, Nightingale also had a brother named Hyde. She had spent her whole childhood in Silver City, and that was the happiest period of her life. Chapter 63, Old Story Nightingale had spent her whole childhood in Silver City, and that was the happiest period of her life. However, this wonderful time only lasted until the winter she turned 14. In that winter, 
refugees started a riot in Silver City. Her parents went out to distribute food but they never came back. Nightingale and her brother were sent to the home of her father's brother, another branch of the Jilin family. This was also the winter that Nightingale had awoken to her witch powers. She carefully hid her abilities, but in the end she was still discovered by Mr. Jilin, who immediately separated Nightingale from her brother and used her brother's life to threaten her into doing his biddings, so Nightingale had no choice. Mr. Jilin sent her to the Thieves Guild and made her undergo their training. Later, he had her do some shady things, like breaking into the homes of his enemies to steal trade contracts or other important things, and eavesdropping on the town hall meetings. She even had to go to some potential competitors' homes and put poison in their water tanks. The Jilin's family business grew bigger and bigger, but Mr. Jilin's attitude toward Nightingale gradually turned worser and worser. If even the slightest thing went wrong, she would be kicked. Every time when she wasn't doing something for him, he would shut Nightingale in a room in their house which had its door replaced with iron bars. The part which made Nightingale the saddest and most puzzled was that she wasn't able to see her brother hide. She began to suspect that Mr. Jilin had already killed her brother. Having had enough of her repeated requests, he finally brought over her younger brother. However, when Hyde saw Nightingale, he had a look full of disgust and said that he never wanted to see her again because as a witch and the devil's companion, she should go to hell. Hearing this, Nightingale's world collapsed, but the nightmare wasn't over. Mr. Jilin gave her the final blow, the fact that she became a witch was a secret, but he still told Hyde, and even told him that the farther he got away from a witch the better it would be. After Hyde bid Nightingale farewell, Mr. Glenn grimly warned her that Hyde would inherit their father's title, but if she wouldn't continue to obey his orders, he would make her brother die quietly. In this way, Nightingale fell deeper and deeper into sorrow and despair and turned into a puppet manipulated by the Jilin family. On her coming of age day, she had to complete a task for the family and was on the way home when she met Wendy. Or, more precisely, Wendy found her. Wendy told Nightingale everything about the Witch Cooperation Association, and told her that there were many people who had gone through similar experiences like Nightingale's, but these sisters had not given up. Hearing this, Nightingale's shattered heart suddenly ignited with a new spark of life. She didn't need much time to change from confusion to determination. One week after her coming of age day, she had already overcome the torture, forcing her magic to undergo great changes. Her fog no longer hid only her figure, but also kept the iron bars from holding her back. On the day that she had finally recovered from the afflictions of her coming of age day, she entered her world of fog to step into Mr. Jilin's bedroom to take a knife and slit his throat. Mr. Jilin let out some high-pitched breaths, and then only the sound of popping blood bubbles could be heard. During the whole situation, Nightingale found out that she was much calmer than expected. Then, Wendy and Nightingale left the Jilin household. As for her brother Hyde, she ignored him and did not want to see him again. After this, she and Wendy started their journey towards the Witch Cooperation Association. When Nightingale came to the end of her story, she waited for a moment, but when she felt that Roland was still immersed in her past, she left the room to retire for the night. As for Roland, after a long time, he had finally collected himself and remembered that Nightingale once said that every witch had a long history of bitterness. If they could reach their day of adulthood, they could even be considered lucky. While Roland crossed over, it was fortunate that he had become a prince. The next morning, Roland went to visit Wendy in Nightingale's room. After a night of rest, Wendy's color looked a lot better, and the previously injured arm looked totally healed. Despite her still being weak, she sat up and bowed to pay tribute to the prince. I already know about you, thank you for saving the life of Nightingale. Roland took a parchment out of his pocket and went straight to the point, there is no doubt that with Kara as their leader, it will be impossible for you to return to the Witch Cooperation Association. So, it would be better for you to stay in Border Town and work for me. If you agree, you only need to put down your signature on this contract. You will get the same salary like Anna, and every month you will get a gold royal. Your Highness, Nightingale blinked hesitantly. Roland knew what she wanted to say. After all, this would change her life. In addition, after Wendy had saved her life in the mountains, Nightingale didn't want Roland to force her to make a decision immediately. In Nightingale's view, as long as Wendy stayed in Border Town for some time, she would certainly come to their side. I would like it too if I wasn't forced to talk about this in such a hurry, but some things become a little more dangerous with every day of delay. 
Roland paused for a moment, but Wendy didn't interrupt him and quietly waited for him to continue. I think I may know a method to how a witch can survive her day of awakening without any pain. This remark brought a loud outburst from the two witches who asked with one voice, What? It's just my speculation and there is no tangible evidence appeased Roland, but I think I know the reason why witches in the camp suffered less pain compared to their life in hiding. The only difference between both situations was, while they were hiding their identity as a witch, they didn't use their magic power, but during their life within the camp, they had to use their ability to maintain daily operations. Wendy nodded her head, you're, that's right. And in Anna's case, she trained her ability daily before her day of adulthood, and she even fell into a coma because of overdrawing her magic power. When she finally regained consciousness, she had overcome the most difficult hurdle as a witch, and even without any injury. So, I think this is probably the key to conquer the demon's bite that attacks your body. I believe that a witch is a kind of magic container, and during adolescence, the witch is always accumulating magic. When this magic exceeds the body's tolerance level, it causes harm to the witch's own body, and the demon's bite itself is dated with the witch's day of awakening, the witch's most powerful moment. So if a witch can continually release her magic, constantly keeping her magic on a safe level, maybe the torture the witch would have to go through during the day of awakening would be greatly reduced, or even completely disappear. Roland paused for a moment to let them think, and then he said, as the lord of border town, I can offer your witches a safe place to use their magic. No one will arrest, send you to a trial, or even put you to death for using it. If my guess is correct, then there is no doubt, that border town will be the end of your long pursuit of the holy mountain. A witch was taught from the beginning that her dangerous capability was given by the devil. After endless suffering, the witch would feel that it wasn't her own strength but instead that her power was a curse, starting a vicious circle. The more the witch didn't want to use her magic, the stronger the bite would be. Directly after the crossing, Roland's attitude towards this force was the completely opposite. After going through the memories of the old fourth prince and ruling out the existence of a god, he had simply seen the magic as a kind of energy, an energy which was controlled by their own willpower. Wendy was silent for a long time, but then she asked, when I sign the contract and agree to work for you, then I want to know first, what will I need to do for you? During the past few centuries, because of their unique abilities, some witches were bought by a few ambitious people and were secretly imprisoned, used as consumable tools. Although the church would look for and punish such behavior, it was still difficult to ban. In addition, they used to be ruthless towards the witches. Once they had lost their value, their fates could be described as a spectacle too horrible to endure. Of course, Roland had also heard of these cases, but he took a fancy to the long-term interests and believed that this was a win-win situation for everyone. So, he smiled and replied, the first thing you need to do is practice your ability repeatedly until you fully grasp it, just like Anna. Chapter 64, Curiosity. Three days later, in the castle back garden, Sister Anna, Nana pulled at Anna's gown and called her name to get her attention. Yes. The latter turned around and asked. What do you think about Sister Nightingale, don't you think she has been behaving a little weirdly? Weirdly. Anna was confused, do you mean how she has been dressing herself lately? Nightingale stood at Roland's side, just like the many times before, but this time she was not wearing her usual gown with a strange pattern. Instead, she was now dressed like Anna and wore the strange clothing his highness had invented. Although Anna did not want to admit it, the new attire accentuated Nightingale's tall figure her shapely legs, slim waist, as well as her long curly hair most vividly. Together with her cloak and pointed hat, anyone would let their gaze roam all over her body. I wasn't talking about her clothes. Nana muttered, don't you think that her tone of voice when speaking with his highness and the expression in her eyes when she looks at him have become different compared to before? Have they? Nana didn't know what to say, but then she gave up, well, Sister Anna, later when it's too late, don't come to me and say that I didn't warn you. Unable to make heads or tails of it, Anna shook her head and ignored Nana, focusing on the two new witches' bodies instead. The first one she looked at was named Lightning. Her general size was the same as Nana's, but she wore particularly unusual clothes. When Anna roughly counted, she discovered that Lightning had at least 12 seamed pockets on her piece of rag-like coat. As for the other witch Wendy, she didn't wear the same body-concealing clothes Nightingale wore before, 
but on her ordinary and casual women's clothes she had the exact same pattern that Nightingale's previous clothes had printed on them. However, she had something that didn't sit right with Anna. The other one's chest was, too grand. Since you both have agreed to sign the contract, we can now start with your training for the first time. Roland was finally at ease and started the training of his two new witches, issuing instructions. Lightning, you go first. Yeah. Lightning was so happy to start first that she threw her hands in the air as she stepped out of the shed. At the moment, only a few snowflakes floated in the air and no wind was blowing, so the little girl gently floated in the air and waited for Roland's next command. Show me your fastest speed. Roland looked upwards and shouted to her. All right, look at me she gave him a thumbs up, went into a starting position, and then quickly flew around the castle. Roland visually calculated her flying speed and came to the result that her flying speed should have been between 60 and 80 kilometers per hour. These numbers were based on his own experiences of driving back in his old world. For a single flight, this speed couldn't be counted as fast, since it was similar to an ordinary dove. However, Roland had heard that she could carry Nightingale and Wendy during their journey back to Border Town. That feat was a lot more impressive compared to her speed. What would that mean if she could lift up a weight of more than 100 kilograms? In Roland's eyes, he could already see lightning carrying a 100 kilogram bomb. However, the next trial broke his wishful thinking. When the weight was more than 50 kilograms, lightning's flying height decreased sharply. From the previous 100 meter altitude, she suddenly fell down to only 10 meters. While carrying nearly 100 kilograms of weight, she could only reach a height of 2 meters. That is to say, if he turned lightning into an incarnate bomber, even when only carrying a few kilograms of explosives, she would enter the range of crossbows and become an easy target to shoot down. So Roland came up with new ideas for this young witch, whether it was as a scout or as an investigator for the right place for a bombardment, she would be an excellent candidate. Previously, Roland seemed to have hit a wall with his plans, but now he could see a glimmer of hope again. While the prince tested lightning's flying abilities, Wendy stood by quietly at his side, closely analyzing Roland's every expression. In the 15 years of wandering after her departure from the monastery, she had seen many different kinds of people. Commoners, farmers, artisans, soldiers, and nobles, it didn't matter who it was, but they would all have the same reaction. As long as they didn't know that she was a witch, they showed her desire and love, but when they became aware of the fact that she was a witch their desire and love would instantly convert into fear and hatred. Every time she saw this despicable behavior, Wendy wanted to vomit. She thought she would only be partnered with witches for the rest of her life and never be accepted by a man. This was also the reason why she refused Nightingale's offer, not out of mistrust, but because she was afraid of getting her heart broken once more. However, Roland Wimbledon had already changed her opinion. He looked at them with the same expression as he looked at common people, like he had already seen witches thousands of times. When she met Roland for the first time in Nightingale's room, she had thought that he hid his aversions towards witches extremely well. She also believed that another reason he didn't show any contempt was because Nightingale stood directly beside her. However, during the next few days she discovered that the expression on his face was still the same. Could it be that the ability of a member of the royal family to hide their true intention is much better than us commoners? Another changing point was the contract. Previously, Wendy had thought that it would only be a formality, but when she began to read it, she found it filled with dense clauses. It didn't only list their responsibilities, but it also stated their own rights. This is simply inconceivable. It still put the witch in his army, but it didn't deprive them of their liberty. Instead, it was quite generous to them. Could this still be called a contract? For example, Article 2.1, it was the first time that Wendy saw such a structure, the witch could have paid leave which meant that she would still get money even on the days she didn't work. Next, the witch should complete experimental projects according to the employer's orders, but when part of the project was too difficult to complete, wasn't timely possible, produced discomfort, or caused the witch to feel that it was too dangerous, the witch could ask for changes or reject the experimental project. Then, the next clause said that the employer should provide for and guarantee the safety of the witch. The employer was responsible for the witch's accommodation, food, and salary. When one part of the condition was not met, the witch was allowed to unilaterally suspend the contract. Wendy thought these articles were a bit prolix, but they expressed their meaning very clearly. After signing the contract, 
the witch wouldn't be turned into the prince's possession. Sure, she had to do his biddings, but she also had equal rights and was always able to say no. Do a contract like this, she finally felt the sincerity of the other side, if it was only for appearance, it wasn't necessary to write such a detailed list of treaties. Coming to this conclusion, Wendy couldn't help herself from looking at Nightingale. Wendy was very clear of everything Nightingale had to go through, and she also knew how deep the other one's disgust of nobles sat. But now, when Nightingale spoke with Roland, her tone and demeanor showed so many different kinds of emotions, I'm afraid even she isn't aware of these changes. Two months ago, she left the camp of the Witch Cooperation Association in the direction of Border Town. Only in two short months, Nightingale has already begun to completely trust this man. She would rather cut off all her relations with the Witch Cooperation Association than to never see Border Town again. In her heart it was very likely that she already saw the place beside Roland Wimbledon more as her real home than the Witch Cooperation Association. It's very sad about what happened to mentor Kara. She, as the founder of the Witch Cooperation Association, had forgotten how important every surviving sister was. Wendy knew that there was no way she could ever go back. Since fate had brought her to this place, why shouldn't she believe in the choice Nightingale had made? Just the same, like she always believed in the choices I made. Wendy. Ah, with this shout, Wendy was brought back out of her daydreams, only to discover that Lightning had already finished her tests and that now everyone was waiting for her. Giving everyone an apologetic smile, she walked out of the shed. You have already made your decision, so now you have to go through with it. Plus, you cannot lose to the younger generation, right? But at this moment, the horn call could be heard from the west again. The sound echoed in the mountains, breaking the tranquility of the town. Chapter 65, Ominous Sign There had already been several instances before when the horn was blown. Each time, several dozens of demonic beasts had attacked, mostly one after another, but every time the skilled militia had been able to push them back. So when Roland heard the sound of the horn once more, he did not panic. He calmly suspended the training and sent Wendy and Lightning back to the castle to rest. He also ordered Anna to protect Nana who would go to the medical center to wait for the arrival of wounded soldiers. Roland himself rushed to the walls with Nightingale. Unexpectedly, when Lightning heard Roland's orders, she began to protest, though I'm already such an experienced explorer of the western border of the continent, I have yet to witness a large-scale attack by demonic beasts. If I don't grasp this chance, I'm not worthy to call myself an explorer any longer. So, I plead you, your highness, let me travel together with you. Roland did not hesitate for the slightest moment to reject the young witch's plea and told Wendy to make sure that lightning would behave. After all, they weren't allowed to lose any time when a horde of demonic beasts attacked. Then, he looked at Nightingale and asked her if she was ready to go. She nodded, took hold of Roland's hand, and took him into the fog with herself, moving straight in the direction of the wall. Once he knew that Nightingale could bring any other object she was in contact with along with her into the fog, Roland immediately became hooked to this kind of travel. In the fog, they could travel straight through obstacles and ignore terrain. They were able to cross several meters with one step, so this kind of traveling was very enjoyable. When they arrived at the foot of the wall, Roland found a corner where no one could see him and stepped out of the fog to walk to the outlook alone. Looking into the distant wilderness, he could only see a world of white instead of the expected grand demonic beast invasion. Was this a false alarm? He could also feel the confusion coming from the direction of the militia, who had already taken their defense positions. When the prince finally found Iron Axe, Roland saw that he had a serious expression while staring into the distance with his hands tightly grasping the horn. When Roland arrived next to him, Roland immediately asked, Did you sound the alarm? Yes, your highness, you see, Iron Axe's voice was much drier than usual, that guy came. That guy? Roland looked carefully in the direction Iron Axe pointed at. There in the far distance, he could make out a faint black spot that was nearly invisible even in front of a pure white background, very difficult to be spotted. The rule was that only if it was determined that the patrol couldn't resolve the problem, they were allowed to sound the horn. Knowing this, Iron Axe as a seasoned hunter must have had his reasons. That is a hybrid species, Iron Axe had to swallow and calm himself before continuing, the last time I encountered this bird was six years ago. Is it really a hybrid species? Roland frowned. Theoretically, evil beasts would attack Longsong's stronghold until the point that all of them had died, 
possessing no intelligence, the beasts had no concept of retreat in their minds. The defense of the Longsong stronghold had never been broken, but this hybrid beast not only survived, but was even able to live after six years. Thinking about what this could mean, Roland could detect a faint feeling of foreboding within his heart. However, the demonic beast was so far away that Roland could only vaguely see a black spot while Iron Axe was able to clearly distinguish the type of demonic beast. Iron Axe's vision had to be really amazing. Perhaps he had misinterpreted it, the prince thought hopefully. The demonic beast didn't make Roland wait too long, it soon began to move closer to the walls, allowing everyone to notice its unique body. It didn't have the large body like the previous hybrid beasts had, but instead, it looked like an enlarged version of a cat at first glance. However, on its back, it had a pair of wings that covered its body on both sides when they weren't spread out. Its head looked like that of a lion, but with an extra pair of eyes, if the extra eyes it had weren't for decoration, then it wouldn't need to turn its head to see every movement made in the area at its rear. Carter and several hunters had loaded their flintlocks and were prepared to take the challenge. However, the lion hybrid didn't attack straight away, but instead stopped outside of the crossbow firing range, carefully taking in everything. The distance it stopped at was within the effective range of their flintlocks, but the probability that the first salve would hit was almost zero. Not long after it stopped, it suddenly leaped towards the left side, spread its wings, and took off with its huge body. As Iron Axe had previously said, it could fly or glide a short distance. After it crossed over the barriers, the hybrid demonic beast quickly flew towards the western end of the walls, attacking the unguarded area of the wall. Seeing all this, Roland's heart madly began to thump. It felt like a nightmare come true. It had observed its enemy and judged their strength, detected and attacked their weakness, proving that it possessed high intelligence, which was previously the weakness of demonic beasts. They occasionally attacked the weakness of their prey, but that was an instinct honed by many generations over thousands of years. When facing an unknown opponent, they would not judge or even more, attack their target after long analysis. What did having intelligence mean? Humanity relied on its remarkable brain with outstanding capabilities to climb to the top of the food chain from nascent prairie life. For the moment, Roland did not dare to reflect on it. Instead, he waved his hand, and told his chief knight, Iron Axe, and his hunter squad to follow him to shoot down the demonic beast. It rushed towards the unmanned segment and jumped straight over the wall, easily leaving the wall behind it, and ran straight towards the residential district, disregarding the whole hunter team as if they were nothing. The beast. Roland shouted loudly, the second militia team go to the wall and temporarily defend the wall. The first team will come with me. At this point, the new team had not had enough time to get trained. With this move, he could lead them away from the battle, but if the demonic beast came back, they could attack it separately. Carter led the guards to follow the prince. They were the group with the strongest individual strength and were ready to face the enemy at any time. Behind them followed Iron Axe who was leading the team of hunters equipped with guns. After entering the old areas, they couldn't see very far since their view was blocked by the houses. With narrow roads covered by snow, they had to be careful and limit their actions. Hoping to find traces of the demonic beast, Roland was afraid that there was no other possibility than to disperse his team into many small ones and let them walk through the streets. He regretted that he didn't let lightning follow them. If he had a witch who could investigate the situation from the air, he wouldn't need to split his team and send them into every direction. After searching for around 10 minutes, they suddenly heard some townspeople scream from deep within an alley. Changing their direction, the team rapidly advanced toward the source of the sound. Because most of the militia were people from the old district, they immediately found their way through the many small streets, making it appear as if they were taking a walk in their backyards. Finally arriving at the source of the sound, Roland saw a man bitten into two parts with his internal organs scattered all over the ground, obviously dead. My god, it's Iron Fork, I know him, someone shouted. Damn, in which direction did it run, asked another. Look, the beast is right over there. Suddenly someone shouted. Shortly after the voice fell, a dark shadow swept out from the house on the right side. Accompanied by debris from scattered wood, it flew directly through the wooden wall of a hut and directly attacked the first line of militia, pawing and biting them. Iron Axe was the first one to react. He wanted to shoot the beast with his gun, but he discovered that his view was blocked by the other members of the militia. Trying to get the right opportunity to shoot, 
he squeezed himself through the crowd and walked step by step in the direction toward the hybrid species. Other hunters also discovered that they had the same problem and took their guns under their arms before jumping on the eaves or climbing up the roofs. The hybrid species didn't care about the approaching man. It spread its wings, stood up on its hind legs and began to shake around the soldier it had bitten, spraying blood everywhere. Seeing this scene sent the crowd into a panic, causing the crowd to fearfully step back. When the hybrid species got some space it tried to jump, but in this moment a shot hit it. Suddenly, several black flowers bloomed on the monster's fur. The hybrid species which was hit by several lead balls roared in anger, threw away the prey in its mouth, and jumped in the direction of the hunters on the roof. When the demonic beast appeared above the crowd, it came directly into Iron Axe's view, who quickly raised his gun and aimed at the beast in front of him and pulled the trigger. It was nearly impossible to miss a shot this close. It was even so close that the gunpowder entered the nose of the demonic beast. The velocity of the bullet wasn't reduced as it went straight through the target's eyes and penetrated its brain. The body of the demonic beast became stiff and suddenly fell towards the ground. Chapter 66, Battle of Hermes, Part 1 As the freezing cold rain fell, it diluted the smell of blood that covered the whole of New Holy City. While in these inhuman conditions, Alicia was fighting for her life by swinging her great sword while violently panting. It wasn't her first time participating in the battle to defend Hermes, but she had never thought that there would come a day when the new holy city could fall. The walls were completely destroyed. In her whole life, Alicia had never seen such a horrible monster. A huge worm-like hybrid beast came out of the ground and pressed its body close to the glacier cliff, drilling its bone claws into the cliff and climbing up the wall step by step. Even when it had reached the top, its lower body still hadn't left the ground completely. If it had only a huge body it wouldn't have been such a disaster, but none of them could expect what had happened next. When the huge hybrid species opened its mouth, a horde of demonic beasts rushed out and turned the wall into hell within seconds. Originally, it could still be said that everyone in her team was calm and prepared, but when the demonic beasts attacked, everything was broken and turned into disorder. During the chaos, Alicia was separated from her squad, so she could only helplessly watch as one of her comrades was swallowed by a demonic beast. Warm human blood and black monster blood mixed together and flowed along the grooves on the stone-paved floor. When the horn gave the signal to retreat, Holy City's Mangonals began to fire, dropping granite blocks the size of half a person from the sky, totally disregarding that many defenders were still fighting on the city walls. Alicia could still clearly remember the image when her captain was hit on the side of his head by a stone. When she got up from the floor and was finally able to look at him, she saw that he was embedded into the stone floor together with his armor. Folded together like a parchment, his intestines were dripping out of his opened abdomen, and his hot blood pooled into small puddles. Alicia thought, if I hadn't thrown myself onto the ground at the last second when I discovered the stone, I'm afraid I would have ended up just like him. As for how she exactly managed to stay alive and return from the walls, Alicia wasn't able to clearly remember it. She was only surrounded by yelling and cursing, everyone was frantically waving their arms, trying to defend themselves, but in the end, who they were hitting was unknown and it didn't matter if they hit a demonic beast or one of their own. From her own team, which started with 100 soldiers, only 12 survived, including herself. What to do next, Captain? Captain Alicia. Since Alicia had survived, she was to take over the post of captain, as per the military regulations. If the captain was killed during the battle, the vice captain would take over the post of captain and lead the team to continue the war. To clear her head, Alicia bit her lips until an iron taste filled her mouth, then she finally decided, we will go to the north gate. If the demonic beasts want to leave the new holy city they have to pass through that point. Following this order meant that they gave up the area between the walls and the whole inner city, but she had no other choice. There was no place comparable to the central church, nothing was more important than the Hermes Cathedral. She didn't say it aloud, but everyone knew that with only 12 people, they couldn't play an important part in defending the walls. In her heart, Alicia prayed, maybe today will be the day I will die while defending the kingdom. May God be kind to me. However, to the outside world, she shouted, Verdict will never give up. We will march. Verdict will never give up, shouted the others in union. Alicia's team of 12 followed her and trotted in the direction of the northern gate. During their run, 
The sound of the war became less and less clear under the rain and blowing wind until it completely died down. Upon her arrival at the North Gate, Alicia saw that there was already a crowd of survivors from other squads in front of the drawbridge. Evidently, they were thinking the same thing. This made her heart feel a little better. However, in this time of crisis, they actually let down the drawbridge. Seeing this, Alicia began to frown and walked towards the handsome warrior in charge who was wearing the standard red robe of a presiding judge. She gave him a salute, presiding judge, sir, I'm the captain of the 4th battalion advance team, Alicia Quinn, I'm Tucker Thor, responsible for the defense of the North Gate. You've worked hard, the man nodded acknowledgingly and said, we have set up the emergency area at the other side of the gate, if your team has any injured you can send them there. Your honor, I don't understand why you aren't raising the drawbridge in this time of crisis. The demonic beasts on the wall can attack us at any moment, we must ensure that they don't conquer the inner city. Calm down, captain. I know that you and your team are not afraid to sacrifice yourself for the greater cause, but that sacrifice would now be meaningless. We are still far from the church's point of no return. He tried to calm Alicia down, and wiped the rain from his brow then continued, we have to work together. If you run out of pills to expel the cold, remember to ask the quartermaster for more. When the presiding judge reminded her, Alicia finally recognized that she was totally frozen. After she left the heat of the battlefield behind her, the cold rain and the sweat on her body mixed together, almost turning her into an ice puppet. Facing the forever blowing ice-cold wind, she couldn't suppress her body from shivering any longer. She grasped into her sheepskin vest pocket to pull out a bag whose contents she then dumped into her hand, only to find a viscous liquid flow out. It seemed that she had accidentally damaged the pills during the battle. Finding nothing valuable, she sighed, raised her head disappointed, only to discover a new cold expelling pill in front of her. Take and eat it, Tucker Thor said while reassuringly smiling at her, when the moment comes again I may ask you for the favor to be returned. Alicia didn't try to be polite, she immediately took the pill and swallowed it, maybe we won't have a next time where we need this kind of stuff. Yes, well, that would also be alright, Tucker actually nodded in approval, if I have to choose I would choose death instead of eating the pill. Just when his voice fell, a strong smell of fish washed up from Alicia's stomach. Even the stomach churning smell of death in the city didn't have such a disgusting taste. She didn't feel like she had eaten a pill. Instead, she thought she had eaten a mixture of flesh and blood, releasing an unbearable tingling feeling from her abdomen into her body. However, the chill faded suddenly, followed by a hot flow of blood through her whole body. Alicia's body temperature was slowly restored to her normal temperature so that the already frozen sweat began to fall down. Her head also began to release water vapor and then finally she could feel her numb toes again. But we won't die today, seeing her eat the pill, the presiding judge waved his hand, at the moment, the god's army of punishment is rushing over from the cathedral. When they arrive here, the demonic beasts won't be able to pass the north gate. Take your people and send them to the assembly, and also remember to let them check if they still have their pills so that they don't end like you and discover that their pills were destroyed when they needed it the most. The god's army of punishment is the strongest elite army in the church. Alicia had already heard of them long before, but she had never witnessed them fight. But, even if the god's army of punishment was as powerful as the rumors said, they were still humans right? With a human body alone, no matter how hard they trained, they couldn't easily beat a crowd of mixed species. But since the presiding judge said so, she had no way out from sending her 11 survivors to the north gate, close to the western side of the assembly. Hundreds of troops had been gathered here after their retreat. They were standing in groups of two or three in the cold rain, disregarding the cold water that was flowing down their cheeks. Some of them even sat on the ground with a listless look on their faces. Only a small number of people had lined up a neat row, waiting for the enemy to arrive at any possible time. If it were still some days ago, Alicia would certainly have stood up and scolded them, but now, she was at a loss. In order to establish this new holy city, countless people were buried here. It could even be said that each brick was built with the blood of believers and people sent by the military trial. The bishop had often said that Hermes was built on holy ground, the capital of the kingdom of God. Today, however, the kingdom of God seemed to be falling by the hands of the demonic beasts. The demonic beasts are coming, someone suddenly shouted, take your positions to meet the enemy. 
Alicia shouted loudly to raise the spirits of the soldiers, lifted her sword, and gazed at the fast approaching horde, for Hermes. For the new holy city. Chapter 67, Battle of Hermes, Part 2. The expected final battle didn't happen. A soldier went to a woman standing in the front line and pressed against her sword to keep her back. Stand back. His voice wasn't loud, but it was still clear and strong. Alicia noticed that even after the intervention of this unknown person, her side was still holding their positions. Looking closer, she could see a eye on the man's sleeve and under it was written God's Army of Punishment. She tilted her head, and not far from them a team of tall warriors rushed out of the north gate. They were all dressed in the same whole body armor, which had a silver sheen under the rain, and their red cloaks waved in the wind. However, all of them had different weapons, some were holding swords and shields while others were holding halberds or iron axes. After they crossed the bridge, they didn't march as a team. Instead, they spread out and went straight against the incoming demonic beasts. What kind of tactic is this? They are creating a total mess, they faced the demonic beasts with power and speed that exceeded what was humanly possible by far. Do they want to fight the demonic beasts completely alone and without any order? Moreover, how could we let the god's army of punishment fight alone against the demonic beasts? We have to support them. No, the unknown man shook his head, looking somewhat gloomy, you have to stay back. If you rush into the fight, you will only drag them down. Drag them down? Alicia angrily stared at the man, could it be that her impression of the man was wrong? Was this person just a cowardly man? She clenched the hilt of her sword, ready to immediately join the battle, although the future of the new holy city was unknown, at the moment of their biggest crisis when they had to face the enemy, she was only allowed to stand by as others fought for them. Before she could even take two steps forward, an incredible scene happened in front of her. Something came flying down from the sky, its shape was just like a fallen angel. Its huge wings were covered in grey feathers, and completely open, it had a wingspan of more than 12 feet. It had a head like a bird, but also a pair of long horns and barbed claws capable of cutting through a warrior's breastplate like they were butter. A vertical drop from the sky was the beast's preferred kind of attack, covered and difficult to defend against. Even when holding a heavy shield, soldiers wouldn't be able to defend themselves, the huge impact force would shatter their arms and crush their rib cages. Many soldiers had already died from their attack without any chance to retaliate. Their only chance to shake it off was by throwing themselves towards the ground, diving away from the dangerous blow. But the members of God's Army of Punishment didn't think about dodging. A warrior wearing silver armor took a firm stand against the enemy, and at the last moment he reached out with his hands and grasped the incoming claws with his hands. The impact force was so strong that a screeching sound could be heard. The warrior bent his right foot while straightening his left foot, stretching out his arms and forming so a straight line with his body, creating a counterpart with enough power to repel the impact. When another warrior saw that the demonic beast came to a stop in the air, he threw a javelin. The javelin was so fast that Alicia could only see a silver flash. It precisely went through the beast's head, directly shattering it at the moment of impact. The warrior who was still holding the beast's claws threw the twitching body away. His arms were abnormally bent, it seemed that the bones in his arms had been broken. Apparently, he hadn't survived the impact without any injuries, but he calmly took his iron axe and began to kill demonic beasts again. They were only relying on manpower to withstand this herd of monsters. Seeing this, Alicia could not believe her eyes. Hundreds of soldiers of the God's Army of Punishment poured into the herd of demonic beasts. Due to their red cloaks, it seemed as if they had merged into a powerful flood of blood abruptly stopping the enemy from moving forward. She now understood what the soldier meant when he said they would drag them down. These warriors seemed to have the ability of ten men. Each of them had the strength, agility, and reaction time comparable to that of a demonic beast, no, they seemed to be even stronger. In front of them, ordinary demonic beasts seemed to be almost like little children. They are too much. Alicia could feel joy from the bottom of her heart. With such a strong group of warriors, Hermes Cathedral would never fall. Ah, yes, I never asked you for your name, my name is Alicia Quinn, and what is your name, Captain? It appears that you already knew the fighting abilities of the God's Army of Punishment. The Captain looked Alicia directly in the eyes, his look was as freezing cold as the rain. When he finally responded, he didn't give her his name, he only muttered, my brother is a member of the God's Army of Punishment. It appears that we will win said Bishop Maine.
who stood at the topmost level of the cathedral, looking out of the window. Here, at the highest point of the new holy city, he used a telescope to look over more than half of the battlefield. Let the Mangonals stop their attack, our army will soon start an attack to reclaim the city walls. You know that winning wasn't the main point, right? Suddenly, another voice could be heard. The possessor of the voice wore the same gold clothes like Bishop Main, but the only difference was that his voice was much older. The important part of this fight was that the armies of the four kingdoms were destroyed. That's right. This way, their defensive lines will be rendered useless said the last person. She seemed to be the youngest person in this trio, appearing to be around her early thirties and also the only woman within the three archbishops. Their standing army of more than 5,000 well-equipped and well-trained soldiers and also nearly a thousand knights were immediately taken out of the picture. They will need four to five years to rebuild their troops. Ah, she let out a moan, and happily continued, it's really such a wonderful day. But in order to achieve this purpose, we had to sacrifice many of our own soldiers, they were the backbone of the church, main side, if this wasn't the fastest plan to achieve our desired goal. I really didn't want to send all of our soldiers into this purgatory. The old man stroked his beard thoughtfully and then said, we had no other choice, the wild beasts had appeared, which was described in the holy book. Following the descriptions in the book, there is not much time left. So, if we do not unify the entire continent and force all the kingdom under one rule, only death will await us. Destruction is actually nothing bad said the woman while laughing frivolously, humans are always greedy have malicious intent, and only see nothing but personal profit. Under the name and banner of righteousness they do much worse things than even the demonic beasts, maybe even the devil from hell would treat us better than we humans each other. Heather, shouted the man angrily while pulling his beard, your comments can be counted as treason and heresy against the will of God, do you want to die? You don't need to take it to your heart, Tefan, Heather shrugged disregarding, her face full of disapproval. The person in charge of this tribunal is me, not you. Besides, do you really think that it's important to God whether we survive or not? How do you know that he is more caring than the devil? You. Enough? Tefan? Heather, shouted Main in displeasure, that is enough for today. I need to report to the Pope, you both will go now and complete the mission. After they left, Main stood in front of the window overlooking the north, with the mountain of despair in the background, a never-ending snow-covered winter land, and in the west, laid the barbarian territory. There laid the beginning of everything. He knew that Bishop Tefan was right, the soldiers in the God's army of punishment were too precious. To join, one not only needed to be faithful but also a strong willpower to survive the transformation afterwards. After nearly a century of accumulation, the church was only able to save 1,000 soldiers. If they wanted to fight the demons, this number was not enough. But the North could only support so many warriors. If they wanted more warriors, they had no other choice than to unify the continent. Of course, Bishop Heather was also correct. She served as the church's judge, holding trials for thousands of witches. Whether they were good or bad witches, they were all gathered and killed with the most savage methods. The higher your position was within the church, the more you could clearly feel, God wasn't good but he also wasn't bad. How do you know that he cares more for us than the devil? When he thought about Heather's words, Maine couldn't help himself from laughing out aloud. I am afraid that only she has the talent to annoy Tefan until he has nothing left to say. God didn't bless the world, nor did he show concern and care for the devil. God will only love the winning party. Chapter 68, Funeral. The funeral was held within an area south of Border Town, on the edge of the wasteland. To call it a wasteland wasn't correct. Banner didn't know when, but one day someone had built a small stone fence around this area. Since then, no one showed any interest in the piece of land. The wall was covered with thick snow, and when observed from afar it looked like it laid under a coat of silver. Although the wall wasn't high, it was easy to step over it. Whenever Banner saw this wall, he couldn't help himself from thinking about the city wall, they both had the same color and shape. Until now, he had only heard from the traveling merchants about such a ritual. When an important member of the aristocracy or royal family died, the deceased's family would go to the cemetery together. There they would play some sad music, and everyone would be allowed to mourn the dead until the coffin was buried underground. The greater the deceased's noble status was, the greater the funeral would be. Even after their deaths, they still get better treatment than us commoners, thought Banner enviously. He asked himself, 
What will happen to my body after my death? Will they just dig a hole at the edge of the forest and throw me into it? Also, no one knows when the months of the demons will end, so there will be no guarantee that no demonic beast will come and dig out my body to eat it. To the people of Border Town, death wasn't something unknown. In particular, each winter when they were forced to live in Longsong stronghold as refugees and live in shacks, many of them died of hunger and cold or died of diseases and injuries. That was already the norm. Nobody had the time and power to grieve for the deceased, the question of where to get the next piece of bread to eat was much more important. But today, His Highness actually wanted to hold a funeral for a soldier? I heard he unfortunately fell during the pursuit of the mixed species, his head was bitten off along with half of his body. Banner knew this unlucky guy, he could be considered as one of the known faces of the old district. No one knew his real name, everyone just called him Ali. Vanner knew that Ali left behind a wife and two children, the older one was around six and the younger one had just learned to walk. Under normal circumstances, the family would be finished now, the widow could still find a new man to live with, but what man would also take in the two stepchildren? Because of this, many children were thrown on the street to let them fend for themselves. Most of these children would then go to a bar to attract customers and sell their flesh and die from strange diseases in the end. But His Highness really seems intent on honoring the promises he gave during the militia recruitment. When a soldier falls during the war, his family wouldn't only get his full payment, but also extra compensation. What had His Highness called it? Vanner had to think for a moment. Ah, yes, he had called it a pension. And the money his wife gets is actually five gold royals. In addition, His Highness will provide them with enough food and charcoal every month, which means that even if his wife doesn't go to work, she will have enough to care for herself and her children. Well, it could be that these are only empty promises, but at least the gold royals are real. He had seen how His Highness had given the money to the chief knight, who later gave the money to Ali's wife. Hell, could it be that I'm a little envious of Ali? No, no. Banner shook his head again and again, trying to expel this stupid thought. With my talent I don't have to sell myself so cheaply to care for my wife, after all, it is most likely that she will become someone else's wife then. After giving out the money, His Highness gave a short but captivating speech. In particular, the phrase while protecting his loved ones and the innocent, we will always remember him, made the blood burn hotter within him. So that was the way it was, he thought, no wonder that in the recent days apart from bread and silver royals, I always thought to follow a greater goal, at least during this winter, we will be able to survive by relying on our own power instead of hoping for the Longsong stronghold's charity. The last part was the burial. Ali's coffin was let down into the previously dug pit. Then, the chief knight made all the militia members line up in front of the grave. Regardless of whether they were from the first team or the replacement, everyone had to step in front of the grave and throw in a shovel of earth into the grave. While queuing, the 200 hundred militia members stepped into their already all too familiar four columns. When it was Vanner's turn, he suddenly felt that the shovel had become somewhat heavy as he took it. He could feel that all the members around him were watching every movement of his, making him slow down. When he finally stood to the side, Vanner could see with his own eyes that the next person in line was now under the same pressure he previously felt. The tombstone was a rectangular piece of white stone, and there were also some words written on it, but he couldn't read them. Ali wasn't the first one who was buried in this place. Next to his grave stood another similar tombstone, covered by snow. When Vanner was leaving, he saw the other new vice captain Brian standing in front of a stone, slowly pouring a pot of ale on the tombstone. Vanner couldn't help but think, if this becomes my last destination, it wouldn't be so bad. Your Highness, during the return back to the castle, Carter suddenly began to talk, what you did was inappropriate, continued Roland. No, Carter thought for a moment, but in the end he only shook his head and answered, I don't know how to say it, but I think no one has ever treated his employees like this, they have neither a title nor a family background, and most of them don't even have a last name. But in the end, do you think what I did was right, asked Roland once more. Well, Roland smiled and laughed, he certainly knew that this kind of ceremony had a strong appeal to Carter, who was also always fighting for and protecting him. When people start to think who they are fighting for and why they are going to war, such a ceremony could be good motivation. For Carter, this change had an even greater meaning, now this kind of honor wasn't just a privilege for the nobility. 
During these times, the common people could already get the same training and teaching the nobility got, but now the civilians could also receive the honor of defending their homeland. The doubled sense of achievement was absolutely inexplicable. Of course, the introduction of the public funeral was just the beginning, Roland thought, he still had many ideas that could be used to enhance the collective sense of honor, such as using flags, playing military songs, establishing a heroic example and so on. It wasn't possible to produce such spirit out of thin air. Roland would only to be able to increase their sense of belonging step by step and always instilling the idea, until it gradually took effect. In order to ensure that the pension project was set in motion and reliable, Roland had arranged all of it by himself. Within the town hall, he had set up a group of people who were responsible for the payment of the food and charcoal. The further along Roland got on his way of upgrading Border Town, the heavier the pressure became on his shoulders. Even so, it seemed that the mining project and upgrading the people's living conditions was on the right track. With sufficient grain reserves, so far no one had starved or frozen to death. Compared to other towns and cities, this seemed to be a miracle, even in Grey Castle, some people had to die during the winter. Even knowing all this, Roland thought that Border Town was still lacking in many places. His goals were much higher than this, but his range of operation had already reached his limit. His assistant minister Barav and his more than a dozen apprentices who he had brought with him were now controlling all the financial and administrative management of Border Town. If Roland wanted to further expand the department, just recruiting some management staff wasn't possible. Roland had already asked Barav if he still knew some protégés, colleague, or favorite pupils, but the answer he got poured cold water on him, even if I knew some, they wouldn't want to come. After all, your highness should know what kind of reputation you have right. Well, that sounds kind of reasonable, but it was really depressing. When they were back in the castle backyard, Nightingale emerged out of the fog immediately giving Wendy, who was standing in front of the shed, a warm hug. Lightning was walking around the unfinished steam engine, looking at it, but when she saw Roland, she immediately pestered Roland to assemble and install the autonomous machine. Seeing all this, Roland thought that all his hard work was worth it. Chapter 69, Cannon System. Four days later in the backyard, two deep holes were dug in the ground. Each hole was in a circular shape, and the deeper it went, the narrower its radius became. At ground level, its diameter was around 40 centimeters but its deepest part expanded to only 26 centimeters. These holes were the molds that Roland intended to use to produce his cannon prototypes. The inner walls of the holes were baked and hardened by Anna. She burned it so long that its surface was without any flaws, just like a shell. She began to harden the shell at the bottom and took all the air bubbles and scum with her as she moved upwards. During history, there were several sizes of cannons, Roland roughly remembered that the so-called 6-pound and 8-pound cannons got their name from the weight of their shells. Roland's first step for producing a cannon was to produce several 12-pound balls, and then calculate their sizes according to the diameter and the wall thickness of the cannon's shell. In the absence of measurement tools, Roland simply created his own custom standard. He took an iron rod and separated it into many small parts with the width of the smallest phalanx of his ring finger, hoping to come close to one centimeter. After that, he created many copies of the iron rods. The diameter of a 12-pound iron ball, when measured with the new iron ruler, was around 12 centimeters. Because of this, the thinnest wall of the shell had to be 4 centimeters, and the rear end which was used as the detonation chamber would need to be 7 centimeters thick to prevent self-explosion. As for length, there were many different kinds of cannons, like the cannons used on battleships, modern tanks, or antique front-loading artillery, so he really did not know which to choose. Taking into account that the shorter the tube, the lighter the cannon would be and the more materials could be saved. Roland dismissively waved his hand, I will just build a cannon with a length of 1.5 meters, if the test's results aren't satisfactory, I will adjust the length later. When the cannon was originally invented, it was built with a wooden core and strengthened with iron rings, just like a barrel. Roland still remembered that this kind of cannon had the risk of air leaking and self-explosion, thus it would be better to mold the cannon bodies completely at once. When drilling out the cannon with a steam engine, there was no difference in producing a 6-pound cannon or a 12-pound cannon. The so-called caliber was just a concept to differentiate between their sizes. If the muzzle was bigger, it became a 12-pounder. Everything beyond that couldn't be used as field artillery. 
but the exact weight of the shells or the cannon balls wasn't important as long as they shoot in a straight line. After all, he was only getting ideas from history and not replicating it. Roland took a deep breath, then he gave Anna the signal to start now. The latter nodded her head, took a steel ingot, and placed it over the hole. Under the power of her green flame, the ingot quickly turned red and began to melt, forming a small waterfall out of molten iron which flowed into the hole. The molten iron glowed red-orange and became so bright that it was hard to look at. In order to protect Anna's eyes, Roland specially set up a support frame at the edge of the hole. She just had to take a good position first and then she could lean against the support frame to produce the cannon without looking into the hole. The ingots were normally only used up slowly. After all, Anna alone couldn't start the era of hot steel, but producing a small batch wasn't a big problem, the most difficult problem to solve was to hold the temperature at the same level, but with Anna's help he was able to produce a small batch of excellent quality steel. This was also the reason why Roland dared to produce a cannon of the size of 5 meters. Compared to the cannons produced out of bronze or iron, the cannon made out of steel was clearly much stronger. Even if Roland built the cannon in the wrong size, the probability that it would self-explode was much smaller. The amount of molten steel was continuing to rise within the hole, but the numbers of ingots were also becoming less and less. Seeing this, Roland couldn't help himself but feel some heartache. In the end, he only could wait until the time when he would be able to build some blast furnaces on his territory. The number of steel and iron ingots a noble could produce was one of the criteria used to measure strength and power during this time. When the two molds were filled, Anna's cheeks were bright red because of her effort. So, Roland took out his handkerchief and gently wiped the sweat from her nose away. Unable to accept this embarrassing care, Anna showed some resistance at the beginning, but after a few seconds she obediently closed her eyes and let Roland take care of her. Her face had a red shine from the light of the molten steel, causing Roland to think about taking a bite out of her. However, when he looked further down her neck, her exposed, slender clavicle entered his view. The both of them were so close together that Roland could smell her delicate fragrance. Ahem, well, Roland embarrassedly took the handkerchief away while trying to control his restless emotions, that was everything for today. Well done, I will tell the kitchen to specially prepare a pepper steak for you. Now wasn't the right time, Roland thought, if I take action now, everyone will think that I am taking advantage of a vulnerable person. I will have to wait until she is completely free. When Anna opened her eyes, she could feel that Roland had wiped away all her sweat, but his face seemed to be redder than before. She gently nodded to Roland and expressed her thanks. In the next few days, Roland traveled between the castle and the North Slope mine several times. In addition to cannons, he also needed to make a sufficient amount of boring tools. The production method of the boring tools for gun barrels and cannon barrels were quite similar. After their removal from the mold, Anna would heat them up again, so that they could be processed with a hammer. It was quite different from producing an ordinary knife. At first glance, it looked like a blunt iron rod. However, the only difference was that it had a gap on its head, which was used to discharge metal debris. At the last step, the iron was quenched to increase its hardness. The production method was quite different from modern high-precision drills. After all, Roland only needed them to drill into iron. Taking their high wear rate into account, Roland and Anna produced five boring tools within a week. Thanks to this boring tools and the usage of the steam engine for drilling, the production of the gun barrels rapidly increased from two each month to ten each day. After everything was ready, the miners would dig out the two cannon embryos, then clean the scum from the surface and transport them onto the carriage smithy. For the production of these two cannon embryos, nearly all of Roland's steel ingots were consumed, a priceless test. So Carter and his whole guard were responsible for the protection of the transport, which let the chief knight feel a little superfluous. Who would steal so much inflexible stuff? According to the requirements of the prince, the blacksmith began to polish and flatten the appearance of the embryo, after the grindstone. When they had finished it, the embryos were delivered into the castle backyard. At this time they just looked like two solid iron bars with dark grey and rounded appearances, exuding a heavy metallic luster. Roland couldn't wait to start the drilling, so together with Carter he brought the embryo to the right place, and placed the tip of the cutter head at the top of the steel bar. With a face full of expectation, Roland pulled the valve on the steam engine. The boring tool slowly began to operate, but not much later it was already running at a steady speed. Begin, the prince loudly shouted. 
Hearing this, the chief knight pushed the sliding base down so that the boring tool came in contact with the embryo. When the tip of the boring tool came into contact with the embryo, a harsh noise which even overshadowed the noise of the steam engine could be heard. As lubricant they used lard, which was packed into the drilling, coming out of the wire as black foam. The onlooking witches withdrew from the wooden shed, and only lightning insisted on staying. It seemed to her that looking at this machine was much more beautiful than any landscape. Chapter 70, Spy, Part 1 Groundhog Cole was somewhat anxious as he looked out of the window. In this hell-like place, it was snowing without end. He thought that the sky looked exactly like his grandmother's sheets which she hadn't washed for years, both of them dirty and grey. Even though he couldn't see the sun, he still had another way to judge the hour. That way was the militia training, as long as the weather permitted, the militia would run every morning, at 8 am, around the town square. The group of idiots had already started it a month before the months of the demons, but they were still doing it even now. Don't these people know that it's most important to save as much strength as possible during the winter so when the time comes that they truly need to run, they won't need to pray to God to lend them stronger legs? However, thanks to this bunch of idiots, he could now determine the right time to leave. That's right, Cole wanted to flee this possessed town. Although he was ordered by the second prince to stay in border town to observe everything that the fourth prince did and then send the gathered intelligence back to Valencia, but now, he had reached a point where he didn't want to stay any longer. His thoughts were, I'm afraid that in less than two weeks I, along with this town's inhabitants will all become the devil's sacrifices. This wasn't him being paranoid. Since the beginning of winter, one strange thing after another had happened. Perhaps other people weren't aware of it, which to him, wasn't surprising. These townspeople don't have any experience, they're all country bumpkins. As long as they have enough to eat, they don't care even if the heavens were to fall down on them. But I'm different, I'm Groundhog Cole, because my skills in stealing information and snooping for news are the best, His Highness Timothy himself hired me for this job. One night, when he had climbed over the city wall, he had discovered a strange weapon that was able to knock down demonic beasts, but of course, this wasn't the most startling discovery. The fourth prince was openly working together with a witch. Merciful God, could there be anything more unholy than this? There can't be any other explanation, the devil is controlling the fourth prince? Even if the prince only wanted to have a taste of a witch's flash, he would surely only do that if he was hidden in his castle. It wasn't the first time for Cole to hear that a noble had become addicted to the taste of witches, after all, there were many aristocrats with strange habits, but it turned into a completely different matter when it was done in public. But this wasn't a delusion, he had seen it with his own eyes. Based on the principle those who are paid have to do the work, every day, when the snow wasn't too high, Cole walked towards the nearby city walls. There, he could often see the figure of the fourth prince, doing his work. In the beginning, he had asked himself the question, what gave the incompetent and spoiled prince the courage to stay in border town during the months of the demons, not piss in his own pants in terror, and run back towards Longsong stronghold? But now he finally understood, the prince had already been replaced by the devil? He had been at his hiding place when the big demonic beast burst through the wall, which was then killed by the devil's thunder. The following rush of the demonic beasts was held back by the flames summoned by the witch, and it was exactly this witch who later threw herself into the arms of the prince. He also had heard constant rumors from his neighbors. They talked about a witch who supposedly had the ability to heal wounds. The witch was said to have cured an injured boy, supposedly she had also cured the broken foot of the old lady from across the street. But to Cole, this was only a blasphemous rumor? How could someone accept treatment from a witch? What would be the difference between them and all the witches who accepted the devil's corruption? However, the last straw for Cole was two days ago, when he saw a witch flying two rounds around the prince's castle and then going down into his backyard. What did the church's father always say? A witch will only get her powers after she had fallen to the devil's temptation. And by now he had already seen a witch with the power to summon flames and another witch with the ability to fly around the castle. Together with the rumors about the witch with healing ability, he came to the conclusion that at least three witches had gathered. Undoubtedly, the devil has turned the castle into his own lair, and now he's gradually beginning to turn the townsfolk into his minions. I have to leave this town as soon as possible. Anyway, I'm holding the alchemic formula for the grey powder used to build the city walls in my hands. As long as I deliver this to the second prince, not only will I not I be punished, 
but I might even receive a reward. From day to day, Cole regretted more and more that he hadn't left when the other aristocracy had left Border Town for Longsong Stronghold. But now, if he wanted to leave this place, the way above ground wasn't a viable possibility. During the whole of winter it would continue to snow, making it impossible to either walk or ride to Longsong Stronghold. His only way was by booking passage on a merchant ship from Willow Town. According to Cole's observations, every first day of the month, a boat from Willow Town would deliver food to Border Town. After two to three hours of loading and unloading, it would set sail again and leave the harbor. He only had this small time frame to get on board. Otherwise, he could only wait until the next month. Today was finally the start of the month's first day. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Just then, Cole heard the already familiar slogan again. He could see a group of men in brown leather uniforms running in full spirit. If Cole hadn't seen through the devil's plot, this would have been a remarkable scene to look at. Finally, it's time to leave, he thought. After putting on his fur coat and fastening his belt, Cole moved away from his cabin. At this moment a neighbor who sat outside of his cabin saw Cole and greeted him, Good morning. Where are you walking to so early in the morning? Cole had to acknowledge that, although Border Town was now controlled by the devil, thanks to this, the life of these souls became a lot better compared to their former lives. They even dared to dry their fish outside of their houses, after all, if the people were hungry enough, even if the fish were as hard as a stone, they would still try swallowing it raw. However, Cole didn't respond to the man's question. Instead, he took a probing look towards the militia and when he saw them running around a corner, he went straight towards the pier. Residents here regarded him as the younger brother of Iron Paddle, who came from the fallen Dragon Mountain range to visit his family, of course, all of this was nonsense. Previously he had caught the real Iron Paddle, questioned him for his name and address and then killed him. He had then taken Paddle's clothes and masqueraded himself as his brother. This was just one casually created identity, so Cole didn't care whether they believed in it or not. Within the last few days, the fallen snow had been cleared from the streets until there was nearly no snow beneath his shoes. He kept a constant speed so that he could save as much stamina as possible, as for the footprints he left behind, he wasn't worried. Within a day the snow would cover all of his footprints. Maybe even by the time he reached Valencia, they would still be in the dark about his whereabouts. As he approached the marina, Cole saw the long-awaited merchant boat. Under the watchful eyes of the guards, bags of wheat were being carried out of the storage room. Cole checked the contents of his pockets again, inside he had two gold royals and sixteen silver royals which was all of the possessions he had. Seeing that there were six guards, Cole thought that it wouldn't be enough even though he had two gold royals. So, his only way out would be bribing the porter. As soon as the unloaded goods could provide him with protection from being seen, he would immediately go towards the porter, and ask him whether he would like to have a good future life or if he wanted to get knocked out. As long as he could get on board, Cole believed, that in all likelihood, the temptation of the gold royals would be enough and the captain would take him away. At the moment Cole was ready to take action, he heard shouts from behind him. His heart immediately became gloomy, when he turned around he discovered that some militia was rushing towards him, coming from all directions and leaving him no way to escape. When seeing that there was no way to escape, Cole immediately put his hands in the air and fell to his knees. One of his mottos was to not show pointless resistance, as long as he spat out all of his employer's information, he would be safe, or probably they would even, try to hire him for an even higher price as a double agent. As long as he got money, he would do anything, this was the principle of Groundhog. But there was one point he didn't understand. How were they able to find him? Chapter 71, Spy, Part 2 In addition to starting the fire in the fireplace, Barab had also placed a mahogany candelabra on the table. This candelabra had one base which split into four branches. One in the middle, which was also the highest, and three branches which enclosed the middle branch in a triangular shape. A burning candle was placed on each branch, and the candelabra looked like a bright mountain as they burned. The room was full of the scent of pine oil, resembling a sweet and rotten wood odor, making people feel drowsy. However, within Border Town, Barav could not ask for more. In this land of poverty, he couldn't ask for anything exquisite or anything elegant. Here, everyone was happy if they had a shelter over their head, so Barav could call himself quite lucky with his big room. His room within the castle wasn't far from the courtyard, 
as it was the location of the former Lord's City Hall. Of course, when the Lord left the castle, he took his whole staff with him, so now the room belonged only to Barav. From time to time, he could hear the rustle of voices from within the castle and the howling wind from outside the window, giving him the impression of two different worlds. The old wooden table Barav was writing at was full of books and scrolls. On both sides, he had arranged a table, forming a U. Usually, the tables weren't occupied by anyone. He only used them to display his manuscripts. When necessary, he would summon his disciples, and place them at one of his side tables. There, they could organize his information or write the first draft for an official document. The candles in the lamp were already changed three times. Beside changing the candles, Barav didn't stop his hand from swiftly working through the documents. To him, time was a very precious thing. There was already a stack of documents at hand, waiting for him to deal with, plus, his highness proposed expenditures would also still need to be reviewed. Barab's average work time was 10 hours per day, but he didn't feel tired at all. On the contrary, this was where he could show off all his skills, so he had the feeling that his body had inexhaustible energy. This is how it should be, he thought, no one is talking around me, all of my apprentices are self-responsible, and no one is holding the others back or creating a mess. As long as they fulfill the prince's command, he can handle the specific administration process without outside help. If the prince's commands could only be a little more normal, while Barav thought this he gnawed on his lips regretfully. For example, at present, all of Roland's official correspondences were sealed with his seal like the last one he sent to Willow Town. In it, Roland asked for additional administration staff and a brig. The answer note said, with the price you offered, you cannot hire the captain, helmsman, and the sailors. After reading, Barav was left dumbfounded, without these people, how would they deliver the boat? Would they walk back after delivering the brig? Also, why do we need to buy a boat? This was the most crucial point. At the moment, the trade between Border Town and Willow Town was stable. Even after the end of winter, if we want to expand the ore trade, we would only need to send a notice, and they would immediately increase the number of vessels for the trade. It just isn't worth it to buy a boat, the town's pier is just for parking and unloading, it isn't usable or maintenance. And without sailors who could care for it, it won't be long before we have to abandon it. Was it another of his highness crazy moments? As for the first request, contrary to what one might expect, Barav could understand it. At present, there was no one with any free time in the whole town hall, Barav had already brought more than 10 people over to supervise the business, they were responsible for the statistical reports and settling income and expenditure. Barav himself was responsible for the administrative and legal work, which was obviously illogical. Since His Highness wanted to separate these sectors, it was necessary to expand the size of the employees in the city hall. Under normal circumstances, the assistant minister didn't want to let go of so many responsibilities. Every person who had this much power in his own hands would feel a sense full of satisfaction. He wanted to be like his teacher, the kingdom's finance minister. He was the only one responsible for Grey Castle's finances and was also the king's right hand. Ahem, well, now only border town is important, added Barav in his heart. Although Roland had promised him that he wanted to fight for the throne, there was still a long way to go. Barav didn't know when it happened, but today he actually contended the fourth prince as a true candidate for the throne. Compared with the past it was the difference between heaven and sky, previous he had thought that such an ignorant and dandy character could never become the king. But since he came to border town, he got one surprise after another. Up to now, Border Town was still able to survive by only relying on the militia. The fact that they were still able to hold was really praiseworthy. Don't even mention all the strange stuff he invented, the fact that he could handle all these people is totally unlike the fourth prince. He seems more like the devil who knows everything. At this time, he heard a thunderous sound at his door, making him stop his work and answer, come in. The door was opened by one of his favorite disciples, Filler Yero, respected teacher, we have caught another mouse. Oh, did you already question him? He said that Timothy sent him. During the body search, we found cement powder, some coins and a letter on him. Yarrow walked up and handed Barab the leather-wrapped envelope, as for the other information, we are still interrogating him. Teacher, how to deal? Just like the previous times, write down all the answers into the book and then hang the convicted spy, ordered Barav. Yes, Yarrow saluted and said, this disciple will leave now, 
When the door was closed again, Varev didn't continue to work. Instead, he went back to his table, and opened the sealed parchment with his letter opener, taking out the letter. The fourth, he thought. Long before the months of the demons had started, Roland Wimbledon had summoned him and discussed this matter. His Royal Highness believed that when the cement powder, the new snow powder and the witches were revealed, his siblings' hidden spies would be unable to bear to not let their master know about it, which would be the best time to eliminate the mice. Thinking about it, Barab had to agree with the first part of his statement, but not the second part. In his view, Border Town had more than 2,000 residents, which made it impossible to control everyone. They just didn't have the manpower, and the people they had weren't trained for it. However, his highness seemed to not see his points and said, why should we need so many people? Every person within border town will be our eyes. Barav couldn't believe that the prince believed his own words and let this ignorant, stupid, and ordinary monitor for everyone to find the mouse? That's just impossible? But the people showed him that he was wrong. When Roland ordered the first census after the beginning of the winter, he gave special orders to the people who had lived for five years or longer within Border Town. Surely Longsong Stronghold had tried to drive Border Town into bankruptcy after their attempt to burn the food, but they had not given up yet. Instead, their spy scent should still be lurking around. Most of them should be disguised as relatives of townspeople or merchants who were too late to evacuate, always on the lookout for an opportunity to harm Border Town. So if anyone saw a suspicious character, they should immediately report them to the city hall. Once it was verified, they would receive a reward of 25 silver royals. The results of this move showed that it was extraordinarily effective. Naturally, in the beginning, they received some false positives, but it was not long before they found the first mouse and thus arrested them. Varav remembered that Roland said this awkward sentence proudly. What did he say again? He thought for a moment, yes. Let the enemy sink into the bottomless sea of fighting against commoners. This sentence had a really strange syntax, the assistant minister shook his head and spread the letter within his hands. The person named Groundhog repeatedly stressed that various phenomena showed that the fourth prince, Roland Wimbledon, had been replaced by the devil, and Barav could clearly read his fear between the lines. When Barav thought about how the prince used several people, he actually could not help but feel a glimmer of recognition. He took a deep breath, and then he held the letter above the candle, the former of which soon caught fire and turned into ashes. Since he didn't fear the god's stone of retaliation, he couldn't be controlled by the devil, right? Chapter 72, Holding Court as a King Timothy Wimbledon sat on the throne, rubbing the scepter in his hand while overlooking the ministers within the pantheon. This is the feeling I have striven for, he thought, instead of being held back in Valencia, where I had to oversee the endless tangle between merchants, who only fought for their own benefit. He stopped the rubbing of the scepter, and began tapping its end on the floor, letting it sound through the hall. When all eyes were focused on him, he nodded and ordered, you may begin. Your Majesty, I have something important to report. The first to step up was Knight Vimar, nicknamed Sir Ironheart, who was responsible for everything regarding King City's defense. Speak. Can the witch hunts be temporarily stopped? Your Majesty, the recent raids have become more and more excessive? I heard that yesterday, several women were taken out of their houses, were arrested, and later assaulted in the dungeons. One of them even died while being in prison. Later it turned out that none of them were actually witches? Now panic has broken out within the outer city. If it goes on like this, I'm afraid there will be a significant number of fugitives. Timothy frowned, he was the one who had ordered the witch hunt. He was still unable to unwrap the truth about his father's death, and was still unable to believe that his father would commit suicide. The strange smile his father had on his face before he killed himself caused him to feel especially creepy. His father wore the God's Stone of Retaliation of the highest quality, furthermore the church had also confirmed that the stone was genuine, but this didn't mean that no witches were involved. Even if the theory was strange, he hadn't a better theory than it was plotted by witches. He looked toward Langley, the officer, and his pawn in training responsible for the raids. The latter immediately stood up and said, Your dearest majesty, it was just an accident, and I have already severely punished the relevant personnel. He started cracking his fingers, the warden, Castellan, and guards have been given 10 lashes and have been fined 25 silver royals. One woman dead and three extremely brutally tortured, and you think some slashes and some money will be enough as compensation, asked Sir Vimar in a cold voice, 
and who gave you the right to judge? Was it the former Prime Minister Vic or the Minister of Justice Lord Pedro? Your Majesty, we are currently facing extraordinary times, so I had to act fast, Langley claimed innocence and fell to his knees, when ignoring some minor setbacks, the raids have shown great success. We have already caught at least 15 witches who were lurking in King City and now they are currently being tortured, so you will soon be able to know whether your father, no, I mean, if they have planned a conspiracy. Timothy glared at him, you idiot, you almost told everyone our true intentions. While the ministers standing in this hall had most probably already guessed that he was the true mastermind behind the plot, but the outside world was only allowed to know his version, where Prince Gerald killed the king, this point wasn't permitted to be overthrown. Fifteen witches. Sir Steelheart sneered with contempt, well, it seemed that King City has already become a witch stronghold. A few years ago the church had started a witch hunt in the forest east of King City, but they were only able to catch six witches. It seems that your men are much stronger than the church's own men. You. Langley shouted loudly but was immediately interrupted by Timothy. Enough. Langley is such a fool, just like the other fools under my control, thought Timothy, who was annoyed that no one with skills was available. If he hadn't needed him at the beginning for the battle of the throne, he wouldn't have promoted this fool. Even if you want to take false credits, don't make up such unbelievable numbers. I'm afraid these 15 women had to face the same treatment as the unlucky commoners. He didn't want to involve the church, but at the moment he saw no other way, so he ordered, you will go to the church, and pay a priest to come over, so he can confirm the identity of these 15 women. Until then, stop the torture. Afterwards you will let the priest confirm every woman you catch. If I later hear that you people have not followed my orders, I will throw you into the city moat to feed the fish. Ah, uh, yes, your majesty. Langley confirmed, I will immediately follow your orders. After Langley had left the hall, Timothy turned toward the finance minister, if there is anyone else who has been wronged together with the previous three, they will get three gold royals each. Regarding the women died in prison, send the money to the family, he paused, multiple times. As you wish, said the finance minister as he nodded in confirmation. Your majesty is very kind. Praised Sir Vimar while saluting the prince. Next question. Timothy waited for a moment, but when he saw that no one had something, he said, since no one has a new issue, I will start with my own. He looked at the Minister for Diplomacy, Yoshua Sir Bullet, it has already one month since the recall order was issued, but no one has come back to King City. Tell me, what news do you have to say? Sir Bullet came from the Flynn family and held his position for 30 years. He had grey hair, an old face, and stood already with one foot within the grave. He cleared his throat, Your Majesty, your third sister Garcia Wimbledon has yet to answer. Your fourth brother Roland Wimbledon has replied. The letter said that, when his people are safe at the end of the months of the demons, he will consider his return. And what else? asked Timothy, annoyed. He addressed the letter to Prince Timothy and not King Timothy. Timothy couldn't stop himself from sneered loudly in disdain. He is as ignorant as before, such a hopeless brother. He thought, if you intend to come back, you will take your instruction from me as your new king. I will give you a good place to live, just like the pampered prince you are. If you don't come back, you won't get an easy death. It will be the same as playing chess, regardless what you do I will have the right answer. Just let him be, Timothy dismissively waved his hand, what is with my fifth sister? Your majesty, she, is gone answered Sir Bullet ashamed. Hearing this answer Timothy asked confused what? What do you mean by she is gone? She was the first one who promised to come back, but a week later her highness disappeared from the palace where she lived, along with her her butler and her two maids. I already arranged staff to find her, but they still have yet to find her whereabouts. What could this mean? Such a waste, she only needed to believe in me? Timothy felt that his heart was full of pain, he had set high expectations for his sister, he had hoped that she could become his adjutant. After all, while growing up, Tilly always performed exceptionally cleverly, and her performance was even more dazzling than his own. She only lost her place as crown prince because she was a girl. In the beginning, Timothy had an excellent impression of her when looking at the arrangements made by his father, it was very clear that the king didn't want Tilly to be involved in this storm. Because of this, he gave her Silver City, which was near King City and had an ordinary business environment with no possibility of training troops. But who could have ever guessed that she would run away? Was this a choice made by a wise man? Now that she is gone, 
the former lord should take over Silver City once more. You should also let the search continue. I cannot permit another person with royal blood to wander among the common people. He gritted his teeth, trying to suppress his raging emotions. Well, until now, only my third younger sister refused to obey. Yes, your majesty, answered Sir Bullet. Since she was so stubborn, we have to take some rough measures, said Timothy while looking at Prime Minister Vic. To start a war, the Prime Minister and the King have to approve it. Since he was his biggest supporter, getting his approval wouldn't be a problem, I'm going to let Duke Ryan guard the south border and force Garcia to give up Port of Clearwater and escort her back to King City. Sure enough, Marquis Vic replied, this should not be delayed, please give the order for war, so that the Minister for Foreign Affairs can carry out the order. Timothy nodded with satisfaction. At the moment when he wanted to order the secretary to write the drafting order, hasty steps could be heard from outside the hall. Then, with a burst of noise, the doors were opened and a knight wearing a blue striped cloak strode into the hall. Timothy immediately recognized him, he was the famous cold wind knight Niam Moore. He walked straight up to the center of the hall, went on one knee and said, Your Majesty, I have just received news from the south, he gasped loudly and his voice was clearly anxious, your sister Garcia Wimbledon, in just five days, defeated Duke Ryan's troops and had occupied Eagle City? She also declared herself as the Queen of Clearwater, and all the lords in the south have responded and declared their territory as independent. Chapter 73, Artillery Test In the west of Border Town, near the Kishui River, the snow didn't permit the car to move a single step further. The entire group of people had already spent half a day dragging the carriage to the artillery field. What is this? asked Carter, who had already become somewhat accustomed to the fact that the prince would repeatedly come up with new inventions, is this just a bigger gun? You are almost right, Roland confirmed. He directed his men to remove the cover so that he could personally adjust the angle of the cannon. He set its angle parallel to ground level, pointing towards a snow pile. The principles of cannons and guns were identical, so calling it a larger version of a gun wasn't inappropriate. The cannon used for the test was able to shoot 12-pound heavy iron balls. Before they could ignite the lead, the chamber had to be loaded with gunpowder and the iron ball. As a reference for the cart, Roland took the old designs from the cannon scene in history books. But to improve their durability, Roland had told the carpenters to replace many parts that were usually built out of wood with their iron counterparts. In order to manufacture the cart for the cannon, Roland almost spent as much time on it as for the cannon itself. Three skilled carpenters needed one whole week to finish it, the especially time-consuming part was the wheels that had the diameter of half a human. First, the carpenters had to produce four square bars of equal length. These bars were then baked by fire until they could be bent. Afterwards, knives were used to peel away the excess. Finally, an outer coating of iron was applied to the wheels. This process alone took more than four days. So in Roland's eyes, this limited cannon made by hand took on a very special place. Now, when he dragged it out for a test, he had already made special arrangements. Chief Knight Carter and the militia commander Iron Axe were both at his side, as always. Also, there was his personal guard along with 20 members of the militia who were acting as sappers and lookouts. As for the witches, he had Nightingale and Lightning by his side. Thanks to Nana, the prejudice towards witches had been significantly reduced. In the eyes of the militia, the most important person here was Nana when excluding the prince. According to the usual process, we have to clean the cannon's barrel first. Roland said, while he could picture the blueprints of the cannon, this particular operation plan was a blank sheet for him. Within his brain he went through various cannon shots he had seen in films, trying to figure out the right process, but only heaven alone would know how effective it would be. Lightning, in high spirits, took a mop and began cleaning the cannon. While cleaning the muzzle, her contract was different to that of the other witches, as long as she was allowed to personally operate all of Roland's new inventions, she would always be willing to help him to the best of her abilities, even without any other payment or remuneration. Since Roland had to save money, he quickly accepted her terms. However, if he had any secret projects, he would still be able to study it secretly. Within his mind there were still many ideas he hadn't realized and were only waiting to be implemented. For now, he would just have to throw her the occasional few pieces in order to distract her. Sweeping around with the mop, Lightning was able to clean up some junk, but in accordance to the process, she had to clean it a second time. Taking another mop, 
She started the cleaning again until she'd finished. Has everyone seen it? Asked Roland towards the crowd of guards and militias. The artillery test was also a drill. If he was able to increase the production rate of guns, the militia was bound to turn into an infantry, exchanging the pike for the gun. But even then they would need to go through many training sessions before they were good enough to use both types of hot weapons. When he saw that everyone nodded, he told Lightning to proceed. The little girl first opened the bag and took out a pocket-sized paper cartridge filled with gunpowder then stuffed it into the end of the muzzle with a ramrod. She then took an iron ball and used the ramrod once more to push it into the barrel. Afterwards, she took out a lead wire from the rear end of the cannon barrel and inserted it into the eyelet to pierce it into the paper back. Thus, the launch preparation was complete. To prevent accidents, everyone had to step 15 meters away from the cannon. Lightning, who was standing close to the lead, saw the first sparks of the lead, but within the blink of an eye, it had already drilled into the barrel. Then there came a loud roar, air sprayed out of the muzzle with such speed, that it even threw up the snow lying on the ground. The theoretical effective range of a 12-pounder cannon was up to a kilometer. Even without any rifling, the cannon ball would still fly in a straight line. Everyone could hear the sound when the iron ball hit the armor that was placed 100 meters away. The iron ball's speed wasn't reduced much, every time it hit the ground, it would bounce back up again, blowing up even more snow. After the smoke cleared, Roland, along with Carter, and Iron Axe, all went directly to inspect the target. When they arrived near the armor, they noticed that the front of the armor was already in contact with its back, and that there was a palm-sized hole within the center. Obviously, the ball speed still hadn't been reduced to zero, since it had still flown 100 meters further. Even after it had dropped to the ground, it had kept on rolling, showing the incredible amount of power it contained. What frightening penetrative capability, sighed Carter. He could already picture what would happen when the enemy stood together in groups, getting hit by several cannonballs that brought terror to the whole battlefield. Three deities above, Iron Axe began to pray. According to him, Roland had to be the messenger of Mother Earth. Except for a messenger of God, who else could bring such a frightening power to the world? He'd already studied the gunpowder's chemistry, it was made of common chemicals which only needed to be carefully prepared. The flame was the incarnation of Mother Earth's anger, as well as her most powerful weapon, at least these were the thoughts of the people in the south. Whenever they saw the never-ending orange flame produced by volcanic eruptions, they couldn't help but begin to pray. The result of the test was similar to what Roland had expected of a classical 12-pound cannon. The cannon's biggest moment to shine had been during the US Civil War and in the time of Napoleon. Afterwards, he loaded the cannon with different amounts of gunpowder to test their power levels. Although he knew that it could cause damage to the cannon, it was still necessary to do the tests. Even after shooting with three different amounts of gunpowder, the cannon still didn't show any sign of deformation. Apparently, the quality of steel used to make the cannon was excellent. In the end, Roland decided that the amount of powder they would use would be the 1.2 times the amount used during the tests. Afterwards, he used the tests to select a gunner. Your Highness, this is indeed a very powerful weapon but it is much too heavy. If we were to hit a pothole, we wouldn't be able to move any further. Carter, who was immediately able to see the problems with the new weapon, criticized, and, after every shot, the barrel has to be cleaned with a wet mop, then it has to be reloaded. Carrying the gunpowder, the cannon balls, and the cannon itself, I'm afraid that you will need five to six people to operate one cannon alone it. Indeed, but it's all worth it. As long as we will be able to use two to three cannons, Duke. No, I mean the demonic beasts, like the kind of giant tortoise, won't be able to break through the wall any longer. Roland coughed, that was close. As for the disadvantages of a 12-pound cannon, he intended to resolve it by shipping. With the help of the steam engine, he would be able to convert a traditional boat into a steam-powered boat. Even if it was the most primitive of paddle boats, it would still have a complex and bulky mechanical system. So instead of changing the boat, he purchased a two-mast sailing boat. With Wendy's help, he would even be able to ship the cannons behind the Duke's troops. With this he would be able to attack the enemies from both sides, and be being able to easily and efficiently annihilate the Duke's forces. Chapter 74, Shipbuilding Project What? Why aren't we able to afford to buy it? Roland asked while going through the analysis of his request to obtain a two-masked ship, which had been put on the table within his office. 
Barav cleared his throat and then he explained, Your Highness, it's impossible. A brig costs between 80 to 120 gold royals, but this would only be the manufacturing cost. We also have to take into account the wages of the crew. Taking all additional costs into consideration we would need to pay up to 200 gold royals. Didn't I say we don't need sailors or a helmsman? We also don't need a captain, we just need to buy a boat. Roland exclaimed while knocking on the table to underline his point. With the help of Wendy, he wouldn't need so many people to drive the boat. River sailing vessels mostly sailed in only one direction. So, to operate it, only the sails had to be set, which made helmsmen and sailors redundant. However, since we can control the wind, why should I be afraid that we can't move forward? Your Highness, there aren't any offers of that kind, at least not in Willow Town. Barav carefully explained, it seems that you don't know enough about this industry. In general, the owner of the ship is also its captain. He might be a merchant or he may be part of the nobility. If they belong to the former group, they will travel between all of the major cities or towns that have a marina, to sell or buy goods. If they belong to the latter group, they would typically recruit a deputy captain who was looking for a boat. Employees won't be paid on a monthly basis. Instead, their salary would be paid for one to three years all at once. Most of the time, the boat and the crew are tied together. You intend to purchase a vessel from a captain, but without the crew he had already hired, so the salary he had already paid will be his loss. Even for a member of the aristocracy, 80 gold royals isn't a small amount of money. After the trade with Willow Town at the beginning of the month, the town hall now has a balance of 315 gold royals, but if we spend half of it to buy a boat now, we won't be able to pay the salaries of the militia. The assistant minister explained without pause, but afterwards, he had to first take a big gulp of ale. After thinking about what he had heard, Roland asked you said most of the time. Yes, Barav nodded, there are two cases when boats will be sold without their crew. The first would be when the merchant is in an urgent need of money, and they have to sell all of their property. They will start by disbanding their crew, and then they will try to sell the ship as quickly as possible. In the second case, the owner wants to replace their old boat with a new one. Both cases would be a good opportunity, but I have to say that this kind of situations is very rare. Wait, Roland frowned, you said to buy a new boat. So in this case, where do these ships come from? Port of clear water? Seabreeze District, Barzai Point. Only cities with a seaport that have a dock are able to produce new ships. Hearing this Roland kept silent for a moment and thought everything through. So this was the original meaning of, within Willow Town, it's impossible to find such a deal. However, I also can't afford to travel to any of the port cities, they're too far away, and if I don't hire a crew, how would I get the ship back to Border Town? Since this is the case, I will have to think about it. When the assistant minister saw that the prince was lost in thought, he quickly left the room. Within Roland's plan for the future, ships played an irreplaceable part. If there wasn't a quick and conventional way to transport the artillery, he wouldn't be able to use them in battle. Generally, the duke's troops were built up from the stronghold's troops, mercenaries, farmers, and knights. So, inevitably their marching speed was slow when they had to move. But, the artillery would be even slower. Just like Carter had said, as soon as they hit a pothole the artillery couldn't be moved any further during this time and age, there weren't any asphalt roads, there wasn't even a stone road. During this time, the people would walk more, producing many trails. During sunny days they would be lucky, but when it rained, the path became muddy. In the end, like always, would he have to rely on himself? Roland spread out a piece of paper, writing down the needed specifications. Firstly, the ship has to be able to carry one or two cannons in addition to 30 people, but it wouldn't be powered mechanically, only with sails. Secondly, since the ship would be used only in rivers, it would need to have a shallow and stable hull. Thirdly, it had to be easy to operate so that the members of the militia could handle it after a short training. Considering all these points, the only possible answer was a flat-bottomed barge. The draft in front of Roland was very shallow, it was a ship with a very low center of gravity that could be seen on almost all of the river routes. In the past, he had seen many loaded with piles of sand or gravel, and their railing was almost level with the surface of the water. And as long as there was a tugboat, it would be able to pull a barge. After determining type of the ship, the next key point was to determine which material should be used when building the ship. Roland wrote down three different options, wood, iron, or canrit. 
Boats made of wood belong to the earliest of the nautical technology tree, from a raft to a masked battleship. From sailing on either the river or the sea, wooden boats could be used everywhere. Unfortunately, Roland didn't know how to use a log to build a flat-bottomed ship, and neither did he have any skilled craftsmen. If he relied on what he knew and on his craftsmen, he would only be able to make a large raft which could fall apart at any moment. Ships made out of iron were built similarly to houses, always taking two beams which were arranged in a crisscross pattern, constituting a keel. The keel formed would then be coated with sheets of iron. Since Anna could do the welding, the overall stiffness was guaranteed. However, this approach would deplete the already small iron reserves. So this could only be the last resort, as building steam engines and cannons was a much more appropriate choice. Then building boats out of concrete would be the last option, since the city wall construction was already finished, there was now a surplus of raw materials. As long as Anna had the time to calcinate, they would have enough concrete for one or two ships. The construction process would also be much easier than that of iron boats. As long as they were able to produce a wooden template which could be reinforced with iron bars, they could quickly fill it with concrete. Even in this rural area, they could easily create several fishing boats out of concrete. Compared to iron ships, they wouldn't rust. With this, the ship wouldn't even need much maintenance. Even though a concrete ship could be built at a low cost, it would still be strong and durable. Even if he had never learned how to make big ocean crossing ships, a river sailing ship didn't need a high level of technological knowledge. So, building it shouldn't be a problem, right? Picturing all the details in his mind, Roland picked up the quill and rapidly began to draw sketches of the barge. An area with a shed near the Xinshui River was hidden by walls. In order to facilitate the launching process, Roland located the shipbuilding area as close to the river as possible. The shed offered shelter against wind and snow and contained two basins for burning charcoal to keep the temperature from falling too far and destroying the hardening effect. The carpenters had already pieced together the wooden template of the hull, the bow was formed in a circular design in order to reduce forward resistance, the aft instead had a square design meant to increase the load area. The boat had a length to width ratio of 3 colon 1 and was built with a width of 8 m. Compared to the traditional ratio of 8 colon 1, it was simply a fat boat. In the center, they had set up two masts. The masts were inserted into the deck and connected to the iron beams of the ship. At the deck, they had placed a reserve rudder. Everywhere, the hull was strengthened with crisscrossing iron bars. Even though they didn't have any iron wire, it didn't matter since Anna had welded all the iron crosses firmly, to form an iron structure which was connected throughout the whole bridge. When the template and the reinforcements were ready, Roland ordered the workers to start filling it up. The concrete was poured into a basin-like template. The middle was flat, but the surrounding walls were 5 meters higher, forming the cabin walls. At first glance, it just looked like a uniquely shaped bathtub. All people who were involved in the construction, including Anna, had never thought that this strange material, which was used to build the walls, could actually also be used to build ships. Chapter 75, Holy Mountain, Part 1 Kara could hear the shortened breathing of the other witches. Someone else has to take over, said Kara loudly, Leaves, you will carry me next. The walk through the impassable mountain range was especially taxing during the snowy winter season. Every day, the 42 witches had to find a suitable place to the camp, where they also could re-empower their badge so that they could resist the freezing temperatures at night. Yes, respected mentor, the witch in front of Kara answered while squatting down. When Leaves stepped to Kara's side, Kara summoned one of her magic snakes and had it wrap around Leaves' arm. She then used it to pull herself up, so that she could stand. As the snake touched Leaves' body, Kara noticed that Leaves started trembling slightly. Damn Nightingale, Kara bitterly thought, if only she hadn't repeatedly refused my offer of mercy, I wouldn't have minded taking her back into the ranks of us sisters. But since we are almost coming close to the critical moment, I can't afford to take any risks. And what was the result of my kind offer? Without any hesitation, the damn traitor took the first chance to escape, she even tried to stab me to death. This is what happens when I'm too kind. Kara's brain boiled in rage, Nightingale's blow had directly pierced her spine. Although Leaves was able to quickly heal her wounds with herbs, Kara's lower body was still paralyzed and without any feeling. Wait until I reach the holy mountain, there I will gain the power to gather more witches, and with their help, I will one day cut you into thousands of pieces. 
While fueling her anger, Kara suddenly heard a voice respected mentor, there are demonic beasts ahead of us. The voice belonged to Scarlet, who was responsible for scouting. With her eyes, she was able to see through all obstacles and immediately discover any trap in front of her. She even had the ability to see fast-moving objects clearly, which was demonstrated during one confrontation with the church where she was able to knock away a crossbow arrow with her bare hands. Put me down immediately. Leaves, you will also go and assist them. Leaves nodded as she crouched down and placed Kara on a stone. Kara's sore hand directly fell into the snow, from where a cold feeling spread through to her whole body, making her unhappily think, you can't even remove the snow before you putting me down? But she didn't say it out loud. After all, Leaves was an irreplaceable member of her sisterhood. Previously Wendy with her kind temper had been responsible for recruiting new members for the Witch Cooperation Association, while instead Leaves had been responsible for maintaining the morale and courage to ensure that the witches would follow Kara's orders. Without her ability, I'm afraid that we would have already lost more than half of our members to the witch hunts. When thinking of Wendy, Kara's heart began to hurt. She had never expected that Wendy, together with whom she had created the Witch Cooperation Association to help as many witches as possible, would betray everyone for the sake of Nightingale. Even after Wendy had blown her away, she didn't want to kill Wendy. The venom released by her magic snake suffering was only acting slowly, but it would cause unbearable pain immediately. After letting Wendy suffer for a short time, Kara had planned to let her snake nothingness bite her and remove the toxin. She had just wanted to teach Wendy a lesson. But no matter what, without the help of her magic snake, the venom was incurable. So Nightingale made the wrong decision by taking Wendy away. Without the bite of nothingness, Wendy wouldn't be able to live one more day. Did that mean that the former nun was destined never to reach their final destination with her sisters? Kara didn't care about the other runaway, Lightning. She had only recently entered the Witch Cooperation Association and only seemed to have the ability to fly. She had always supported another view on how they should look for the holy mountain, even sometimes questioning the holy book. Whenever that girl acted against the will of the Witch Cooperation Association, Kara wanted to throw that talkative little girl into the snow and strangle her. At the moment when the two wolf-like demonic beasts emerged from behind a corner on the mountain path, the witches were already prepared and awaiting the attacks from the demonic beasts. All the sisters without fighting abilities were placed near the end to keep them safe. Leaves was the first to release her magic, aiming at the weeds close to the feet of the demonic beasts. Soon green tendrils broke through the snow and wrapped themselves around that of the enemy's feet. Another witch, with the power to control the air, began to drain the air around the demonic beasts. Thanks to this, the two monsters soon fell into a state of asphyxiation, and were soon foaming at their snouts and began convulsing before finally falling to the ground. This was the power of witches that Kara had been looking for. Within a group of mortals armed with swords these wolves would have wreaked havoc, but in front of us witches they perished within seconds. Clearly, only we, witches with the power of magic are loved by God. If only there wasn't such a thing as the God Stone of Retaliation, bah, to the hell with the stone, she spat towards the ground, if that stone didn't exist, how would the church be able to suppress us? Respected mentor, let's continue forward, said Leaves when she came back to Kara. Have someone else carry me. Kara sighed, you are too tired from the fight. After the battle, they continued further along the path. At noon, the women responsible for finding the next camping ground discovered a place with less snow, thanks to its leeward arrangement. After reaching the place, they decided to take a break and eat in order to recharge their stamina. One witch with the ability to work with stone began to work her magic. When the soil and gravel began to move and shoved the snow away, it seemed that the ground came alive. Soon the ground was flat and dry. One after another the witches began to carry out their duty, like making a fire and setting their pot on it to cook some porridge. They started to heating some snow until boiling and then added herbs which were strengthened by leaves together into the water, which immediately started exuding a sharp fragrance. Everyone please give your badge to me, cried a little girl with rare red hair like a raging fire. It really matched her ability, since her power also had to do with fire. It's allowed her to heat any objects she was in contact with. The badges which had provided so much relief for the Witch Cooperation Association had been single-handedly created by her. Even though at first glance her ability seemed insignificant, the truth was that she was of great help to the Witch Association Cooperation.
especially during their march through the impassable mountain range, where they couldn't find anything to warm themselves with. In the cold snow, it was very easy to lose heat from their bodies until eventually falling unconscious. After everyone had eaten wheat porridge, the witches packed their bags and started moving along. According to Kara's conjecture, the so-called Gates of Hell, was in fact, the gateway to the Holy Mountain. The church deliberately changed its name to Hell to prevent the witches from finding the Holy Mountain. According to the ancient books, they needed to cross a total of three stone gates, the last line before the barbaric lands. Usually, they were hidden deep in the ground, only during the blood moon, would the stone gates come to the surface. After they had set out from the camp, the witches had to walk for about half of a month through the impassable mountain range, but soon they would leave the mountain range, setting foot into the middle of nowhere. During these last days, the demonic beasts appeared more and more frequently. Quick, 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 look, what is this? Suddenly someone shouted in horror. Kara looked in surprise in that direction, becoming immediately stunned out of horror. There was a city flying in the sky. The sky was still grey, and the snow was still falling out of the very low clouds. But within the clouds, there was a city, partly hidden and partly visible. Those buildings were built in a pattern I have never seen before, they look like spires standing side by side. If the black dots are windows within the spires with an average size, the spire would reach a height of hundreds of meters? This isn't something a human could build. Even the proudest building of the church, the cathedral at the Hermes, which they called the tower which reached the sky, was only 50 meters high. Since this had to have been built by non-humans, then there was only one answer, this city has been constructed by the hand of God. Kara had difficulty in restraining her excitement, throughout the whole time the voice within her heart shouted, I found the holy mountain? Chapter 76, Holy Mountain, Part 2. Sisters, it's the holy mountain. We've found it. Kara screamed and showed the whole world her happiness. Many witches foolishly stood in their places, shaken by the spectacle before them. But, there were also others who jumped around and began crying out in sheer joy. Scarlet, however, frowned after looking at the city and muttered, Is this really the holy mountain? Leaves, hearing this, leaned towards Scarlet and whispered, Why do you think this? Is something wrong? Deep down she had the same question. After all, this city in the sky didn't look the same as described in the holy book, where it was said to be golden, splendorous and majestic. This city with its spires also looked spectacular, but it was entirely built in grayish black, and looked bleak even during the daytime. In addition, there was also a red fog above the city, which strongly resembled a blood mist. There was something, it squeezed itself into one of those holes, Scarlet spoke again with a dry voice, I couldn't see it clearly, but it definitely didn't resemble the gods. Leaves could feel all of her hairs begin to stand up. Within the Witch Cooperation Association, it was Scarlet who had the best eyes and could see clearly at this distance. So hearing her say this gave Leaves quite an uneasy feeling. Unfortunately, Lightning had also left with Nightingale. If not, she could have flown near the city and taken a look. Sisters, the Holy Mountain is waiting for us to take it. Kara raised her hands into the air and shouted euphorically, with just a little bit more effort, we will soon find the eternity. Then, she immediately urged Stone to carry her further. Leaves personally didn't want to move forward, but in the end, she still took the first step. She thought, two weeks ago, everyone found out what would happen if someone disagreed with Kara. I'm afraid at this point, there is nothing which will be able to stop her from moving forward. Their marching speed increased by a steady pace. After leaving the foot of the mountain, the snow had unexpectedly reduced and the surrounding temperature had also picked up. This is the legendary Forbidden Lands, the land on which no human had ever set foot before. However, now Leaves could see footprints stamped on this desolate land. If Lightning was here and saw this, she would be very happy, right? When she looked back and saw the mountains towering behind her, she couldn't believe they were able to cross this barrier. Leaves guessed that it was only because of the impassable mountain range that the demonic beasts couldn't flood into the hinterlands. Are they only able to attack from the north because that's where they can pass the mountains? No matter what, if we really find the holy mountain and don't need to drift any longer from one place to another, then I will also be satisfied, thought Leaves as she sighed softly. To tell the truth, when Nightingale came back to the camp and told everyone about her life and future in Border Town, Leaves was enchanted. When Nightingale asked Wendy and everyone else if they wanted to leave together with her, she couldn't help but want to step out and shout her name. 
but in the end, she wasn't able to cross the threshold within her heart and was unable to leave the shadow of the past behind. Leaves shook her head, don't allow yourself think about the past, instead, focus on keeping pace with the others, don't fall behind in this desolate land. Soon they discovered something strange regardless of their speed, the city seemed to retreat as fast as they moved forward. After an hour of marching, the holy mountain was still suspended in the clouds, neither growing, nor shrinking, it seemed just like, they hadn't gotten closer at all. Respected mentor, please order a rest, our sisters are getting tired, said Stone. During this period of marching, the people who had to carry Kara had changed several times, but she was clearly the one who had to bear her weight the longest. No, how could we stop now? Kara thoughtlessly rejected Stone's suggestions, this is a test by our gods, sisters, if we don't show them our strong will, we will never be able to arrive at the holy mountain. We can never stop. We must continue up to the very doorsteps in order to enter the holy mountain directly in front of us. Seeing that her persuasion had failed, she couldn't do anything else other than move forward. Under no circumstances were they allowed to stop, even during two waves of demonic beasts they had to go forward. During the second wave, they even encountered two hybrid beasts, on which Leaves' shackles didn't work and without them she was unable to stop the monster's assault. A sister who was caught off guard had to pay the price for the group's overconfidence. She got her neck cut by claws and her blood was spilled over the ground. When they finally were able to kill all the demonic beasts, they discovered in horror that the sky had gradually darkened. Apparently nightfall would arrive soon. The city in front of them was still visible, but its outline had become more and more blurred over time, seeming as if it gradually disappeared. According to their past experiences, they had to find a suitable campground and build their camp, but in these desolate lands, the surroundings were completely different compared to the mountains. When looking around, all they could see were flat plains infested with demonic beasts. There wasn't a single place of safety where they could rest overnight. Respected mentor, we have to withdraw to the foot of the mountains? Let Scarlet lead us with her red eyes, with her help we might be able to reach the mountains by midnight, pleaded a witch. No. Kara shouted, we have spent the whole afternoon walking with nearly no pause just to reach this place. Now when we have already consumed more than half of our stamina, we can no longer maintain the same speed and return. Sisters, we only can press on further, we can truly find the holy mountain, and there we can settle down to rest. Then what should we do with Sherry, asked a witch as she pointed to the ground where Sherry, showing no signs of vitality, laid. We have no time to bury her, Kara shook her head, keep her here, the earth will accommodate her. Leave sadly closed her eyes, again another of my sisters is gone, if I were only a little more powerful, she wouldn't have to die in this desolate land, without a tombstone to tell of her life. During that time when many sisters couldn't decide whether they should move forward or retreat, Stone suddenly exclaimed, look at the sky, the city is gone. Hearing this, Leaves immediately opened her eyes looked up to see the night sky hidden behind a wall of grey-black clouds. The city had disappeared, just as if it had never existed. Everyone was rooted in their places, and a terrible silence began to befall them. During the whole time the sun had been up, the city had never vanished. Leaves suddenly felt a horrible feeling as though her brain were struck by lightning. She remembered the tales told of adventurers, about those fantastic sceneries seen on the sea. Her whole body began to shudder, and she could only whisper, we have been cheated, soon, she shouted, we have been cheated, that wasn't the holy mountain, what we saw was only a mirage. Mirage. Kara abruptly turned around, looking somewhat grim and asked with a terror-stricken voice, what is that? It is something which lightning often mentioned within her stories. A phenomenon which was often encountered during a sea voyage, but also seen on land, only much rarer. We have seen nothing but an illusion, the real city may be very far away from us, it is even possible that it isn't in front of us at all. Does this mean that it at least exists and didn't just disappear? Kara asked with little hope. This, Leaves took herself some time to answer, I do not know. At this moment, Scarlet suddenly shouted, be careful, something is coming. With a horrified look on her face, she stared towards the left side of their group. Is it a demonic beast? asked Windseeker as she entered her battle stand, how many? No, Scarlet answered and took two steps back in fear, I don't know what that is. After her voice died down, a shadow suddenly appeared from afar, and directly struck Scarlet with lightning speed. Although Scarlet had been able to clearly see it in the darkness, 
She was still unable to dodge it it was just too fast. Almost within the blink of an eye, it had struck Scarlet on her chest and pierced directly through her, even nailing down some other witches behind her. When it finally stopped, several witches had been impaled, and everyone finally saw what it was. It was actually a spear. Chapter 77, Holy Mountain, Part 3 Leaves blood froze upon seeing this horrible scene. To their left, two shadows slowly emerged out of the dark. They were big and had a strange appearance that was nothing like the looks of common demonic beasts. Leaves thought that their appearances were similar to humanoid creatures riding on the back of hybrid wolves. Their bodies were twice as large as ordinary humans, and instead of armor they wore clothes that were made from an unknown material. No, clothes wasn't the right word, it was more similar to bloated animal skin in which they wrapped themselves tightly, thus giving them a bulging look. However, the most eye-catching feature of the two beings were the heads they wore as helmets, they were clearly skulls of demonic beasts, giving them a malevolent and atrocious impression. Their eyes were gouged out of their heads. Instead of eyes, lumps of reddish-brown crystals were sewn in. A patch of skin was attached to the head, extending to the back of the demonic beast's shell. One of the people still had spears attached to its mount saddle while the other one wore an unusual kind of gauntlet, from Leaves' point of view. It looked like they only had three fingers. Suddenly, one word flashed through Leaves' mind, Devil. Attack the enemy. Kara was the first one to attack, and her piercing shout dragged their attention back away from stupidly looking at the enemy. Stone squatted down and placed one hand on the ground, turning the area underneath the snow into a swamp. This could be regarded as a brilliant response. Normally when they reacted fast, the two demonic beasts' mounts could jump and fly the short distance over the swamp with their wings. But apparently not these two, their wings had been cut off, and now a harness was tied to their bare bones to which the devils held on to. Since they could not fly any longer, they would have to go around the swamp, which gave the other witches time to react. But the enemy didn't play by the same rules, they just drove their mounts into the swamp. Using the beast's momentum, they jumped up from the monster's back, crossing over the distance of the swamp and landing behind stone, which was exactly the place where the non-combat sisters were stationed spread out quickly. Leaves loudly shouted at the same moment the devil with the three-finger gauntlet started its killing spree. Its agility was completely unexpected for its body length, the witch standing near its landing place hadn't even the time to react before her head was already shattered by its punch. Until they were finally able to respond, two more sisters got their necks immediately broken, but eventually they fled in panic. Only Shino was still standing at her former place. Although she didn't have any combat ability, she didn't choose to escape like all the others. Instead, she took the crossbow from her back, aimed, and shot at the enemy. But, the devil reacted just too fast, it took a sidestep and then kicked Shino in the chest. The kick was so powerful, that the little girl flew away like a broken doll, her body flipping over several times before crashing into the ground. Blood gushed endlessly from her mouth as she finally laid still. The spear-carrying devil instead turned and walked towards the utterly terrified stone. He raised the spear and aimed at her, but exactly at the moment when it wanted to release the spear, a flame exploded in front of it. Red Pepper had aimed at the enemy's crotch, and after she had released her attack, she took Stone's hand and ran away together with her. When the devil tried to catch up with them, it was stopped by a wall of black grass. Leaves released all of her magic into the ground, letting all the seeds within the earth grow, turning them into vines, which slowly crawled in the direction of Iron Hand, Devil. At the same time, Kara shouted out pain and released two snakes which each bit into one of the devil's arms. Just when the devil finally shook off Kara's snakes, it suddenly felt a tugging feeling at his feet. When it looked down, it saw vines crawling up his feet, and suddenly it was pulled back and fell towards the ground. Run, run, sisters, run! Shouted Leaves with a trembling and fearful voice, quickly, everyone escape! Hurry away from these horrible monsters! They are the source of evil described in the ancient book. They must have directly come through the gates of hell. The torment of the snake's venom seems to be ineffective against the devils. When the fallen down Iron Hand saw that his companion with the spear was in trouble, he frantically tried to free himself from the vines, which held his body down. The devil with the spear went into a throwing posture, which let its arm rapidly swell up. This caused the already thin supporting skin to get even thinner so that the devil's dark red blood vessels and bones became clearly visible. Leaves, look out, 
shouted Stone as she used her quagmire magic again, this time directly aiming it at the devil's feet. The devil was already in its throwing motion and when its foot sank into the ground it had no time to react. Through this unexpected attack, the devil lost its balance and spear that was already leaving its hand changed its angle at the last moment, impaling itself completely into the ground right before Leaves' feet. Seeing all this, Leaves broke out in sweat. The swollen arm shrank rapidly after the spear was thrown, looking just like a dried tree trunk soon after. Seeing that the devil couldn't throw spears repeatedly, Leaves realized that now was the best time to flee. Other witches also noticed this, for example, Stone and Red Pepper. Seeing that Iron Hand was still struggling with the vines on the ground, they ran towards the unattended Kara, wanting to bring the mentor with them when they ran. Leaves, who looked into the direction of Iron Hand, discovered that it didn't try to free itself any longer but instead turned towards the three witches with both of its hands extended towards them. What is he doing? Stop? No Dash Leaves didn't even have the chance to warn the others before glaring blue light burst out of the devil's hands like a lightning bolt it pierced through the air, twisting and hitting her three sisters. Blue rays jumped between the three, issuing a crackling sound of thunder. White smoke began to rise from their twitching bodies which had caught on fire. The attack seemed to have consumed much of the enemy's energy, because it started to breathe heavily and couldn't move. At this point, Leaves magic also reached its limit, and her vines began to wither, turning into dead weeds. Leaves was only able to think, now, everything is over. Kara's desperate cries seemed to slowly get farther and farther away as her own body strength faded away, until she fell to the ground. After only a moment of rest, Iron Hand had already stood up from the snow and began to walk to a panic-stricken Kara, this time there was truly no one who could stop it. When he arrived at her side, Iron Hand grasped Kara's throat and began to strangle her. Kara desperately fought back and tried to break away from the devil's finger, but in front of its monstrous power her efforts were futile. During her desperate struggle, Kara sent her snakes out again, letting them attack the enemy's arm and neck. However, the devil seemed unmoved, and continuing to tighten its hand around her neck. At this moment the unexpected happened. Under the fierce attack of the magic snakes, the devil's skin was finally ripped open. Immediately, red fog began to leak out of the fracture, soon enveloping the devil and Kara. The former released a terrible scream, and under the red fog its skin began quickly to fester, exposing its tendons and bones. Iron Hand had to let go of Kara and instead tried to block the wound, trying to hold back the dissipating fog. But it was in vain, its body began to tremble uncontrollably, and soon fell down to never move again. When seeing this, the other devil whose body was already half buried within the swamp, released a heartbreaking scream, it was a sound Leaves had never heard before, like a sharp scream and a dull roar mixed together, piercing her ear and giving birth to endless pain. But the enemy's scream didn't let Leaves fall into panic and flee. Instead, she only had their victory in her eyes. She bit her lips and tried to pull out the last drops of her strength in order to stand up. When she finally stood, she grabbed Shino's crossbow, reloaded it and aimed at the last devil. The devil clearly understood what Leaves was trying to do and began to work his arms frantically, but within a swamp, the more someone struggled, the faster they sank. The devil he tried to block its vulnerable parts, but yet in the end, it was in vain. For my lost sisters, with that thought, Leaves pulled the trigger and sent the arrow flying. The crossbow arrow accurately pierced the neck, releasing once more the red fog from the wound. After the mist dispersed, its head finally dropped down. She had killed the devil. After letting the crossbow fall, Leaves turned around only to see the bodies of more than ten sisters who had lost their lives. Immediately hit by sorrow, Leaves dropped to her knees as her tears burst free. Chapter 78, A Company Wendy opened her eyes and discovered an unknown ceiling above her. The ceiling was made of grey brick, and had cobwebs hanging from wooden beams along with an unlit chandelier. Slowly, the scene turned from fuzzy to clear until she could see every detail. It isn't a cold stone roof or a narrow tent, she thought, right? Half a month ago we were forced to leave the Witch Cooperation Association. Who knows, perhaps under Kara's leadership they have already found the holy mountain. She took a deep breath. Though it wasn't as clean and fresh as the air within a cave, the warm air and the cozy atmosphere made her very comfortable. Her body was wrapped in a soft and velvety silk and laid on a mattress out of several layers of soft cotton blankets, so when she laid down, she slightly sank into it. Even if she stretched her whole body, her toes wouldn't be exposed. 
She felt a little guilty that she wanted to do nothing other than stay in bed. Even so, she had stayed here for only half a month but here her heart was at peace, something she hadn't felt in a long time. Within the castle, no matter how late it was, no one would ever disturb her. For example, right now, Wendy turned her head and gazed out of the window, seeing that the sky was still grey, even somewhat dazzling. It was probably 10 am. Within her last years of wandering, she had never been able to sleep so peacefully. She would be woken by any small noise. She even had to prepare the food for rest of the day before daybreak out of fear. The whole time they had to live in fear that the church might discover their current whereabouts. Also, no one could guarantee that they would outlive their next demon's bite. Even during their time walking through the impassable mountain range, she was always busy with doing chores. She would help with drying foods or herbs, with drying her cooperation sister's laundry, or cleaning the camp and so on. Even so, Wendy didn't mind doing it. Every time when she saw her sister's smiles, she felt very happy. But now, living such a lazy life, she discovered that she herself couldn't resist enjoying such a life. No, I can't be this lazy any longer. She patted her cheeks to motivate herself to crawl out of bed. After all, when she had lived in the church's convent, the nuns would often warn that lazy people wouldn't receive the blessing and protection of God. In a little while, I will go to the garden and practice my wind control. By the way, every time she remembered that the prince required her to train her magic, she couldn't keep herself from laughing. Such strange and eccentric requirements, for example, after he saw her ability, he had told her that he hoped she would be able to blow the wind over a distance of more than 10 meters. However, there had never existed a magic power that was effective at such a distance. When she told him that she wasn't be able to do it, he didn't get angry. Rather, he came up with a strange idea, she should stand on top of a stool, and use her power to rise up and down. When Wendy tried it, she discovered that it was actually feasible. Seeing the test results, His Royal Highness was very satisfied, so besides asking her to train more, he also asked her if she was afraid of heights. It was exactly like Nightingale had said, Roland Wimbledon is an elusive person, but he is also a prince who deeply cared for us witches. Thinking up to this point, Wendy gently sighed. There really is a prince who doesn't hate witches? Respected mentor, you were wrong. When she put on her clothes, she felt that they were a little small around her chest area, even so, Wendy had already become accustomed to this kind of strange clothing, she just wanted to find a needle to change its size, but before she could, someone knocked on her door. Come in said Wendy. It turned out that it was Nightingale who opened the door and came in, leaving Wendy a little startled, but Wendy smiled and said, is his highness still in bed? If not, you shouldn't have the free time to visit me. What are you talking about? Ah, I'm not by his side all day long. Nightingale said, embarrassed, as she raised her basket, I brought you breakfast. Usually, the maids were the ones responsible for delivering breakfast. In addition, after bedtime, Nightingale would often accompany the prince to chat, so it was quite hard to see her at all. Wendy smiled from the bottom of her heart, I just woke up, but she was already here to deliver food, she certainly had slipped in several times. Now tell, what's the matter, asked Wendy while she took a cheese sandwich from inside the basket and put it into her mouth. Well, Nightingale came over and set herself on the bed, today Nana will go through, that day. Wendy was speechless, since it was Nana's first time going through the demon's bite, it wouldn't be as violent and long as on the day of her adulthood, but still, it couldn't be guaranteed that she would be safe. The younger they were, the less pain they would be able to endure. Wendy placed the basket on the nightstand and went to Nightingale's side, patting her shoulder to comfort her and told her, didn't his highness say that as long as we release our magic every day, we will be able to minimize our suffering. But that is just a speculation. Nightingale contradicted. At least it sounds very reasonable, answered Wendy, didn't Anna safely pass through it? Even so, it was the most difficult of demons bite. It was the day of her adulthood, yet she suffered no harm. This was exactly what you've seen with your own eyes she paused for a moment, then asked, where is Nana? At the moment she is in the medical center, when it came to this, Nightingale's mouth nearly sprang open, I heard that her father, Sir Pine had bought a huge amount of hairs from hunters, which have been sent to the medical center so she can keep practicing until tomorrow. She has such a nice father, Wendy exclaimed a little enviously, I can't remember the time when I was a kid, that is a very strange thing, it's just as if my memories are a blank sheet. There is no father, 
No mother, the first thing I can remember, is my staying within the convent. It seems that I'm a little more fortunate than you, Nightingale teasingly exclaimed. Well, you were really lucky. Wendy sat herself beside Nightingale and took her into her arms, asking her, are you nervous? For a moment, Nightingale kept silent, but then she gently nodded. Wendy certainly knew why the other was so tense. Today wasn't only a crucial day for Nana, no, it was also the day in which could become the turning point in all of the witch's history. If Nana was able to survive this bite, it would mean that witches could thoroughly get rid of the shadow of being the devil's servants, turning border town into the long sought for holy mountain, maybe one day, all witches will gather here. They will be able to live a normal life no difference with ordinary people, no longer having a need to wander around and try to avoid the church's witch hunt. There is no use in worrying about it, we just to have to laze around the whole day and accompany Nana. Laze, around. Nightingale stared at Wendy in disbelief. Yes well, who told you to tell me the news so early? It makes me nervous too, Wendy simply said, since I'm no longer in the mood to practice, we could also use this time to visit Nana. Wasn't something like this written in the contract? It is called paid leave. After eating dinner, Nana's room was full of people, Anna, Lightning, Nightingale, Wendy, naturally also Nana's father, and Roland. Having to face the battle soon, Nana's face was full of insecurity, well, will I have to die? Of course not. They all shook their heads. It's your first time, so the demon bite won't be as strong, Wendy took her hand and spoke encouragingly, just put all of your spirit on the thought of holding on. It hurts, you're breaking my fingers. Serpine held his daughter's hand, you have become very strong during your time within the medical center, I, your father, am very proud of you. The little girl nodded, letting her gaze wander over the crowd before finally focusing on Anna, who stepped forward and kissed her on the forehead, you will survive, right? Yes. Chapter 79, Answers. The curtains were shut and a fire was blazing in the fireplace, maintaining a comfortable temperature within the room. There was a big difference between Anna and Nana's day of adulthood, this time the latter was awake. In order to ensure that she wouldn't become too frightened from the upcoming pain, they played some simple games to distract her, and so that she wouldn't fall asleep during the whole night. Even Roland performed some magic coin tricks, stupefying the onlooking audience. Especially Nana, who for the whole time was staring with big eyes at Roland's hand. If it were ordinary times, she would have surely shouted that Roland should teach her. The magic tricks of this age were still far from being a highlight, for now, it was more a small sideshow, like snakes dancing to the sound of a flute, breathing flames, crushing stone plates on one's chest and the like. Compared with later generations of skillful diversion and nimble fingers, everything now was only amateur level. Finally, Lightning began to talk about her sailing experience, when she traveled with her father between the islands and fjords. Telling of big whirlpools and beautiful reefs, and of hunting giant deep water sharks and octopus. Although everyone knew that part of it was fictitious she still had everyone's attention, even captivating Roland with her tales, in his imagination, those sailing ships turned into huge armored battleships, which crossed oceans and discovered a new world. As a matter of fact, there was a part in the historical timeline of this world he didn't understand. The last written record of the past wasn't older than 450 years. Even the former prince's education within the palace did not mention the reason. But it could also be, that the former prince just hadn't paid attention during the lectures, thought Roland. Within Border Town's library, there was nothing to find, so the only possibility was to win the war against Longsong Stronghold and look and ask there for more information. When Lightning finally finished her stories about her adventures, Roland could no longer suppress a yawn, but when he looked at Nightingale, the latter only shook her head, indicating that there hadn't been any magical change until now. Not having an accurate timing tool is so inconvenient, how can I determine the time we still have to wait? Roland thought in frustration and poured himself a cup of warm water then sat down afterwards to wait. But gradually, everyone got the feeling that there was something wrong, it just took too long, Nana had repeatedly yawned, apparently only barely able to stay awake. Even Nightingale became anxious, so she touched the little girl's forehead, while also closely gazing at the magic power within Nana's body, looking for any change. When Roland wanted to take a gulp of water, he discovered that the water was already emptied. So on the way to the kettle on the fireplace, 
He couldn't help himself from looking through the curtains when he passed the window, only to discover that it was still snowing. But when he had opened the heavy curtains a fraction, a touch of light fell into the room. He was pleasantly surprised to discover that the dark sky had already gained a glimmer of milky white. Everyone look. Roland shouted and pulled open the entire curtain. Alarming everyone with his cry, they all rushed to the windows to see what happened. When they discovered the faint light in the sky, they realized that the new day had already arrived without them noticing. So with this, in addition to Anna, Nana also went through the demon's bite without any pain. When Roland later returned to his room he discovered that there were already two people who were waiting for him, Nightingale and Wendy. Within their faces, he couldn't discover any sense of sleepiness, there was only excitement. Were you able to confirm that Nana's date was today? No, last night, asked Roland immediately. Yes, but at that time the change within her was only very subtle, I would have never thought that it was the bite's critical moment, answered Nightingale with certainty, your highness, your assumption was correct. As long as we witches continue to release our magic, it will continue to grow, and the suffering of our body will be reduced. If we can maintain a certain amount of training every day, all the witches would have a great chance at surviving their day of adulthood. Within the whole kingdom of Grey Castle, only in your territory can we witches display our abilities, in a sense, Border Town is our holy mountain, continued Wendy. I want to beg you to make sure that as many witches as possible know of this news, so that our sisters can speedily arrive in this sanctuary. I think every one of them will be willing to help you. From the beginning, those were my intentions, Roland nodded. By the end of the months of the demons, the normal people and the witches will also have gained a certain degree of understanding of each other and been in contact. By then, I will arrange for people to spread the message, but, only as rumors. You must understand, that I can't start a big advertising project to recruit witches, if so I would cause an uproar within the country. After slightly pausing for a moment he continued, this will only be possible if the church is eradicated, or I gain the throne. So it seems my best option is to help you ascend the throne, declared Wendy and then without any hesitation she fell on one knee, reciting the oath of allegiance. Roland could clearly see that her movements weren't skilled, it just seems to be a spur of the moment. But he did not care about these details, he treated her exactly as Nightingale when he had accepted her oath of allegiance. After she finished her plea, Wendy turned towards Nightingale and asked, how was my performance? The latter curled her lip and said, barely passed. Roland helplessly shook his head, so you two should get to bed early, during the whole night you weren't able to close your eyes. Your Highness, I have a request, interrupting him, Wendy, who had just got up from the ground now she knelt down once again. Speak freely, Roland put away his smile and seriously talked to her. The other's act had made it clear that she had an important matter to discuss. Unexpected Wendy told him I want to, once more, go back to the Witch Cooperation Association's camp. Wendy, shouted Nightingale and stared at her with big eyes, but she could see that within the latter's eyes how steady and resolved she was. I do not know whether or not they were able to find the holy mountain, maybe they were, or maybe not. I hope you will allow me to go into the impassable mountain range after the months of the demons has ended. If Kara was unable to find the holy mountain, they may have gone back to the camp within the mountain range. This will be highly dangerous, Roland frowned, your leader attacked you regardless of your long friendship. If she really had wanted to kill me, I would already be dead, said Wendy. She had summoned her magic snake pain instead of death. I don't know how many will come back with me, or even if only one will come back with me, but at least I can deliver this important message to my sisters. As long as they release their magic every day, they won't need to suffer the terrible pain. Speaking up to this point, her voice became very gentle, your highness, as long as you continue to treat us witches with so much kindness, my life will be yours, so naturally I won't throw it away so easily. I will protect myself. So please allow me this request. Roland fell silent and thought, when thinking about safety, I ought to refuse her request. But there is also a different meaning to this request, if I give her the chance to save more witches, she will happily follow my orders and take any risk. But if I refuse her, she might still be willing to follow the orders, but I may lose the possibility to gain more witches, and she will forever carry a scar on her heart. I'll allow it, Roland finally nodded, but you will still have to wait for two months until the end of the month of the demons. You also won't travel alone, lightning will go with you. 
I will also give you firearms for self-protection, as well, a godstone of retaliation. Lightning can give you long-distance support, and when you wear the godstone of retaliation during your meeting with Kara, her or any other ability won't be able to hurt you. Your Highness, please also let me go with her. Nightingale pleaded. No, Veronica. His Highness's safety is much more important than mine. He is the hope of all of us witches, Wendy disagreed as she shook her head and laughed, take good care of him. Chapter 80, Artillery. A week after the concrete ship was placed in the curing room, it was finally the day to launch the vessel. All the workers were stunned when the prince ordered to put the oversized bathtub into the water, making everyone wonder whether they misheard him. However, they hadn't had misunderstood him. His subordinates had to dismantle the temporary shed and then they had to dig a slope at the bottom of the concrete ship, leading into the river. This part had to be handled with great care because of the weak tensile strength of cement products, even a small knock on the ground was enough to create small cracks that could destroy the whole vessel. The ship was placed on top of logs, and the speed at which it slid was controlled with ropes. When everything was prepared, the workers let the wrist-thick rope slowly slide through their hands, careful so that the vessel would always be pointed in a straight line. While the workers shouted their slogan in sync, the ship slowly slid over the logs, creating a harsh sound of friction. Fortunately, everything went well, and Roland could see how the ship got slowly lowered into the water. The ship sank nearly half a meter into the water, with more than one meter still above the surface. The workers were totally surprised to see that this massive construction made out of stone and metal didn't directly sink into the riverbed with a loud bang, but instead peacefully floated above the surface. Hurry! take the ropes and put them around the bollards and then tie them tight, commanded Roland loudly. If the vessel wasn't tied quickly to the bollards, the water current would carry the ship along with it southwards. Although Nightingale didn't show herself to the public, but after seeing this shocking scene, she couldn't help herself and ask with a voice full of wonder, why does the ship float? Well, it's quite simple. The ship's average density is lower than that of water, and as long as this is the case anything can float on water, explained Roland and after a moment of thinking, he added, that the ship is built out of iron and concrete doesn't matter. In fact, you should have already seen a huge sailing boat, those also weigh much more than several stones. Since he didn't hear the voice of Nightingale again, Roland assumed that the other was still comprehending what he had said. Even Anna wasn't able to immediately understand the concept he had explained. Discovering this, Roland smiled and continued to direct the worker's next task. The subsequent hardening of the concrete took a lot of time, and every time it began to snow heavily, the work had to be stopped. Only when it didn't snow for more than one hour, were they able to continue their work. The most time-consuming task was the construction of the deck, which was built out of many wooden planks, and supported by many small stakes which were placed between the bottom and the deck. Although this was a waste of space, but taking into account the primary purpose of the concrete ship, this didn't matter so much. Afterward followed the rotproofing. The carpenters knew very well how to do it. First they brushed a layer of oil with a pungent taste onto the deck. When the oil had dried, they repeated this procedure several times until it was finally coated with a red paint. Once the deck construction was completed, the installation phase of the upper building was started. The so-called upper part consisted of a wooden shed which was placed between the two masts, and which later would be used to store guns and ammunition. When it began to rain, the shed could also be utilized by the crew as shelter. The roof of the wooden shed was extra thick so constructed that a person could stand on it, a special place only created for Wendy. As long as she stood on the roof, her magic ability would range far enough to cover the entire sail. The stern rudder was made of melted iron, and its installation was a bit cumbersome. First, it was required that they put the rudder shaft through a previously made hole, which now laid under water. To steer the ship, Anna welded a triangle plate at the side of the rudder shaft, which ended under water. At the other end of the rudder shaft, which ended on the deck, was melded an iron ring which could freely rotate. The welding was naturally done by Anna, who was also shocked and puzzled by the fact that a stone bathtub could float on the water. Since she had the same problem like Nightingale, she also asked the same questions. So Roland had to answer the questions, again and again. Afterward Anna went to the side and sat down to think about it. Well, I have still a long way before me before I will be able to raise the education level. In the end, Vanner didn't know if it was better to become a gunner or if it was better to stay with the hunter squad. 
Everything changed when he got the important order three days ago, his royal highness decided to transfer out some members of the first and second militia team, who performed exceptionally, building a new elite force. When Vanner's name was called, he felt very pleased. But when he was asked if he wants to join Iron Axe's hunter squad or the new gunner squad, he didn't know what to choose. He was aware of the new flintlock, which allowed them to fight against the demonic beasts, due to its much stronger penetrating power than a hand crossbow. Currently, only Iron Axe, the chief knight and a number of senior hunters were allowed to use this weapon. Vanner was supposed to join the hunter squad without hesitation, but he instead spoke out of turn and asked, what is a cannon? When he learned that a cannon is 10 times as large as a flintlock and that its power is a hundred times stronger than the strength of a gun he fell into a dilemma. Apparently, the more powerful the weapon used by oneself is, the higher one's own value is for the prince. So joining the artillery seems to be the better selection than the hunter squad, but the advantage of carrying a gun is that it is possible to carry it while walking through the town, attracting the eyes of the people, which was always Vanner's dream. Although the cannon's power is 10 times that of a gun, surely it isn't possible to carry such a powerful weapon while walking through the streets, right? Until the last day of the deadline he wasn't sure what to choose, but in the end, he took the artillery. The last point which brought the decision was that the salary of a gunner was 5 silver royals higher than that of a hunter. With his decision, the rigorous training began. A cannon needs 5 people to operate it, and to Vanner's team were assigned job, Cat's Claw, Nelson and Rodney. Since Vanner was previously a vice captain within the first militia team, he was also chosen as the gunner. Compared to guns, this cannon gave 10 times more trouble. Since the beginning of the previous month, Vanner had secretly observed how Iron Axe operated his gun, making it able that he even was able recite the process fluently from memory. But the cannon had to be always switched from the limbered and mobile state into the ready-to-shoot state, always having to go through the tedious work. Stop the horse, pull out the pin, pull the hook, move the cannon cart, push it towards the shooting spot, prevent it from dropping, these processes needed five people to cooperate in tandem. Such as when pulling the hook, the other people have to push the support cart away from the cannon, turning it from a four-wheel vehicle into a two-wheel vehicle, without that the cannon's barrel would drop to the ground. When the barrel is finally filled with the ammunition, it's ready to shoot. The shooting is quite similar to the gun and the cannon, but the cleanup of the cannon with its usage of two different mob is much more complicated. When using a gun, the ammunition can directly be put into the barrel. To start the cannon they had to ignite the fuse, but when it's raining, it could be quite difficult to use this weapon, Savannah had thought. Fortunately, as a gunner most of the time he had to order the others around, and so he didn't need to spend too much effort. For the first three days, the four newly selected artillery teams had only one cannon to train with. So under Iron Axe command, the groups had to go through the process of stopping the mount, unloading the cannon, preparing it to shoot, loading the cannon on the cart and then restart the whole process. These four steps were always repeated, Vanner even suspected, that under the uninterrupted cleaning of the cannon, the cannon became even much cleaner than his own face. Chapter 81, Artillery Training Every day Vanner's group had to train for two to three hours with the new weapon, and even after the training was finished, Vanner had to return to the wall to continue his old, boring job. One of the men from Vanner's dormitory had signed up for the new firearms squad, and now he had a brand new firearm and stood behind him to show off the weapon. If the discipline didn't forbid infighting, Vanner would have already sewn up his hateful mouth. However, Vanner also thought that there was something fishy. Didn't my compatriots join the firearms squad only several days ago? Yet, they were allowed to directly start their shooting training through fighting against the demonic beasts, but what about our artillery team? We aren't even authorized to shoot. Moreover, the cannons are so heavy, it's impossible to transport them onto the wall. When he looked at the top of the wall, he could see that the wall walk was almost full with people standing side by side in pairs. Usually, everyone was used to running on the inside of the wall walk. Even if it was steep, it was still better than interfering with teammates' fighting movements. As for cannons, the two wheels alone were wider than the whole wall walk, and using a cannon to shoot downwards didn't seem very practical. Could it be, this cannon wouldn't be used to fight against the demonic beasts? The next exercise confirmed his conjecture. Iron Axe brought the four artillery teams to the river. There, Vanner discovered though he didn't know when it happened an actual, huge ship. 
No, he wasn't sure if it was right to call it a boat. The shell looked to be made out of the same grey stone that was used for building the wall, and its dimension was very wide but short. So in addition to two bare masts, was there any other similarity with a ship? Regarding this point, he and his teammates had a heated discussion. This is clearly a pontoon bridge, the first one who came up with a conclusion was Job, who belonged to the team that followed the ships transporting the ore to Longsong Stronghold. Because of this, he often thought himself well informed. They built the deck so wide to make it more stable? During my travels into the south I saw many of them, and if this is a ship, then how can it be moved by the wind? Previously, the river was too wide to ford, and a decade ago the former bridge was washed away by a flood. Now the former bridge should be replaced with this pontoon bridge. They will just place several of them side by side and connect them with an iron chain to make it more stable? The furthest place you have traveled to is Longsong Stronghold, yet you call yourself knowledgeable, Rodney sneered, if this was a pontoon, why would it have two masts? Wouldn't they need to worry about it being blown away by the wind? And when you look towards the end, don't you say the steering wheel? Pontoons don't need this. Nelson directly jumped into the frying pan to help Rodney. These two brothers would take every given opportunity to vent some anger, in addition, look at the construction between the two masts, doesn't it seem to be a cabin, it's just not finished yet. This is a ship, no doubt. To Vanno this discussion was of little interest, he was only concerned about the next training's content. To his luck, he soon got his answer when Iron Axe asked them to drag the horses that pulled the cannon towards the small town, yes, this was the ship's name, personally appointed by his highness. After listening to Iron Axe's introduction, Jop's face became suddenly stiff, while the two brothers showed a triumphant expression instead, and then they began to drag the cannon onto the deck of the ship. On the deck were two groups of stopping poles, each group consisting of four poles. These stopping poles were located in the middle of the deck, with one group behind the other. This apparently indicated that one ship could store two cannons. Well, with this, Vanner was sure that they wouldn't be needed to deal with the demonic beasts, the Kishui River flowed from the north to the south, and there wasn't a large river hidden in the demonic beast infested forest. When they embarked for the first time, they immediately discovered the outstanding stability of the ship. Even though the river flowed quickly around the ship's hull, the ship was still motionless, it just felt like standing on solid ground. Only when the horses came on the ship did they feel a little swing. Vanner also noted that when a team finished their firing practice, Iron Axe would count the time and note it down. When Vanner saw that there were only two places for cannons, it was clear that only the two fastest would get a place on the ship. So, Vanner secretly told his discovery to the rest of his group, which immediately gave rise to their strength, with each person putting at least 10% more effort into the training. If they weren't chosen for the artillery team, upon losing much face, their life would become more trifle, but the most important matter was that they wouldn't get improved pay. Vanner had to wait until the seventh day, but he finally received his first live shooting training. On this day, His Royal Highness the Prince also came to visit the scene, watching the artillery exercise. Everyone in the four groups walked with a broad chest and large steps. Because of their training, his group became quite familiar with the loading of the cannon, so it didn't take long until the first shot was fired by Vanner's team. This was the first time he saw the power of a cannon. With a deafening roar, the cannonball was shot out and landed around 500 m away in the snow, blasting a lot of snow and mud into the air, and afterwards, it bounced once more into the air. With his eyes, it was impossible for Vanner to track the iron ball. Seeing this, Vanner wondered how the prince managed to create such a terrible weapon. If you had to face artillery attacks, even with body armor, I am afraid it would be to no avail. After each shot, the group was changed and the prince ordered someone to mark the landing position. Afterwards, he let someone measure the distance between the muzzle and the flag. After four rounds, it was finally Vanner's turn again, but then he heard the command to change the cannon's angle. A scale marked with 0, 5, 10, 25, and 30 was placed at the cannon's end, where the cart was connected. Although Vanner saw this scale, he didn't understand what it meant, but as long as they just followed the instructions, everything would be alright. Iron Axe shouted, shoot at the angle of 5. Hearing this command, Jop, who was the one with the greatest strength in Vanner's team, took the ramrod, inserted it into the muzzle, waited for them to open the hook which held the barrel at the right angle, and pressed it upwards until the scale showed 5 and snapped the hook in. 
Compared with the angle of the barrel at the beginning, where the barrel was a little low, the barrel now pointed a little higher. This showed that the scale marked how high or low the barrel's muzzle pointed into the sky. When everything was ready, every group fired one more shot with a new angle, and after every shot, the distance was also measured. Vanner could gradually understand what the prince did. He recorded the distance of every shot fired, and the higher the angle of the barrel, the higher the iron ball would fly. This was a point where Vanner could use his experience from shooting with a bow, the higher up the aim, the further the arrow would fly, the flatter the shooting angle, the earlier the arrow would hit the ground. However, he hadn't thought about that in the case of the cannon. Just because it is faster, the flying distance would be so much further. Suddenly, he got this crazy idea if the iron ball got faster and faster, would it be possible that it would never stop? At Kishui River, Little Town's testing phase was also underway. Since Wendy would act as the ship's driving force, the ship's personnel needed to be absolutely reliable. So, Roland picked some people who already knew about the witches as the first crew of Little Town. Carter became the captain, the helmsman was Brian, the sailors who had to set the sails were Carter's subordinates, and the job of correspondent went to Titus Pine, Nana's father. These people often came into contact with the witches, so coupled with their own mental transformation where they got rid of their prejudice against the witches, there shouldn't be a problem. In the case of Sir Pine, it was even less the case, since his beloved daughter was a witch.